Good afternoon. Welcome to Seven's Education, Tuesday, February 7th, 1.31 in the afternoon. We're going to start our day off by returning to a review of the administration's school safety bill and hear testimony uh, and talk to the McClure Foundation about their commitment to CCB, continue some of our conversations around uh, education financing, community schools, technical education, uh, Senator Chittenden's bill on uh, kindergarten enrollment age, and then some follow-up conversation around from BSAC. Ms. St. James, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Good to see you. You as well. And uh, if you wouldn't mind just bringing us back to what this bill is doing, as well as talk a little bit about the edits before we turn things over to Jeff, Jay, and Sue. Sure, Beth St. James, Office of um, Legislative Council. Um, you should have, in, well, up on the screen, eventually you'll have in front of you and posted to your website is what's been labeled as draft 2.1 with uh, yesterday's date of February 6th. This is the committee's bill on school safety, and the substance of it in the body of the bill is the language provided by the Agency of Education. Um, the uh, top of the bill here in the statement of purpose lines 4 through 12 is a uh, essentially a um, kind of straightforward summary of what the bill proposes to do, and there was some feedback provided that it was not as accurate as it could be. So the language um, you see highlighted are the changes between the statement of purpose and the um, from draft 1.1 and the uh, draft 2.1. They really surround what independent schools are required to do. The original statement of purpose um, in the highlighted language indicated that the independent school is required to develop a policy on um, the action contemplated. And this new language um, you'll see there on line six uh, is very specific to the uh, independent school is required to conduct a biannual option-based response drill following the template developed by the Vermont School Safety Center. That's language taken directly out of the bill. And then line 10, um, item 5, is um, that independent schools uh, are uh, asked to adopt an access control and visitor management procedure, not policy. Um, and then the rest of the bill remains unchanged. I just take the bill for now. Thank you. I'm going to pass this around. We can wait on. Oh, this is the. the, the, the oh, okay. So, uh, any questions on what Ms. St. James just ran through with regard to edits? Would you like me to stick around to hear it would the be testimony? Great. If, if you prefer to uh, do it remotely, that's fine too. But uh, if you would stick around in some way, that would be terrific. Mm -hmm. okay. Mr. Francis, are you all speaking from one voice on this? Or? Yes. You are, pretty much. So, OK. Good afternoon. Right. Thank you. I'm Jeff Francis. I'm the executive director for the School Superintendents Association. I'm joined by many of my colleagues, but two in particular, Sue Soglowski over here. She's with the BSBA and Jay Nichols. Um, I wanted to start by thanking you for the opportunity to testify and also make it clear from the outset that our associations support updating statutory requirements in order to address the important matter of improving the safety and security of Vermont schools. In other Francis, words, I'm sorry, Chuck, may I also just quickly ask, is the NEA, are you all together? NEA it Different. is not with us okay. on this. Thank you. Uh, they may be, yeah. but we did not work with them. Appreciate it. That's so um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the approach that we took. And it was an interesting process to watch because the administration came up with a proposal. They passed it to the General Assembly. Miss St. James did drafting. We got involved when our association started to talk about the proposal that came from the administration. And in my case, on the day that you visited with us over at Capitol Plaza, 
we talked about this bill, and superintendents started to raise what I would say were subjective interests with regard to what they knew of how drills were conducted in schools presently. Um, I took that under advisement and decided that these three associations that are represented by me in the Vermont NEA, along with um, Rob Evans, who's a school safety liaison, and in my case, Brooke Farrell Olson, who was a member of the Vermont School Safety Crisis Planning Team. She's the superintendent down in, in Fairhaven for the uh, Slate Valley School District, should get together and talk about the legislation. We did that, and we came up with, I would not say major concerns, but some specific interests in the bill. Um, after that meeting, we thought it was advisable to meet again with Mr. Evans and also with Emily Simmons, who's the general counsel for the Agency of Education, along with Sue Siglowski. Um, and I point out at this point that um, Sue's an attorney, as is um, Emily Simmons, and we just talked about the bill. So we um, focused on the specificity of the bill. Um, in order to make sure that the language was right. And I would say that we were mildly disadvantaged in that process because in talking with Emily Simmons, she, she participated in the conversation, but she said, with regard to anything that you see in the bill, it's really now in the hands of the General Assembly because the administration had passed it off. And when we contacted Ms. St. James, who is always gracious in our communications with her, she didn't acknowledge whether she um, accepted our points or not, but said, really, now this is in the possession of the Senate Education Committee, so I'm not going to change a thing unless I'm directed to do so by the committee, and specifically the chair, which we understand the process. So what we have done in a series of meetings is take a look at the bill and utilizing um, our experience, and in, in Ms. Saglowski's case, her expertise, and we made some observations and subjections, excuse me, and some um, observations and suggestions. And I would say they range from the technical to the substantive. Um, so as we worked through that process, we decided one way to do it would be to give you a markup of your first draft of the bill and give you margin notes with the comments that we had. Um, so you, whether you, mm -hmm accept our recommendations or not, whether you find our points to um, have merit or not, you've got a document which lays it all out. So w with your permission, what I'd like to do is just quickly go through these comments, and then um, at, that, at that completion, uh, with your permission, uh, Mr. Chair, if you'd let Sue or Jay comment on, on anything I missed, and then we'll respond to questions. Sure. Okay? Um, so the first comment that we raised has already been addressed, and that was the statement of purpose. Um, uh, it wasn't consistent with what the bill actually did, and Ms. St. James um, corrected that, at least with respect to the form that the bill is currently in your draft 2.1. Um, our second comment, um, and there are little lines that tie the comment to the place we didn't, we lost the, um, the, the, the line numbers, but the second comment just looks at the section that calls on supervisory union or supervisory district, and we're suggesting that that um, be replaced with school district boards, and in the second comment, which is the second pink comment on the page, it shows um, that the school boards are the entity authorized by statute to adopt policies. So we think that where there's a policy adoption requirement, it should cite school board rather than supervisory union or supervisory district. Um, the third comment, and I see the comments are enumerated, um, in our discussions with Rob Evans and Brooke Farrell Olson, it was determined that drills are and should be conducted according to written guidance. So we're recommending that the word template be stricken and replaced by guidance. Um, and the reason is because the, um, the guidance that school districts get really go to the frequency and nature of the drill, which is different than a template. A template is a plan that one would follow, and you'll see that as we um, go through the draft, we do utilize the term template in the appropriate places, we think. Um, so that was the third comment. Um, the fourth comment, I would say, is very substantive, um, and that is 
in my conversation with superintendents, and I know in Mr. Nichols' conversation with principals, and I know from listening to um, uh, Mr. Tinney's testimony for the Vermont NEA, that we believe that the guidance for conducting options-based best practices have to be trauma-informed. And I did not include this in my testimony, but I'll give you the link to this. Um, in preparing the testimony, I took a look at this document, right, which I found online, called Best Practice Considerations for Armed Assailant Drills in Schools. That's what option-based drills are. It just talks about how to conduct them in school settings with a lot of sensitivity to the people who are going to be participating because they have the potential to invoke trauma. So I am far from an expert on that, but um, our collective review of the issue tells us that however guidance is issued um, under statutory requirements, it, the, the, the actual um, practice for the drills needs to be trauma-informed. My belief is that because um, the Vermont School Safety Center is very uh, school-focused, understands that, and because the Vermont School Crisis Planning Team, which advises the Vermont School Safety Center, um, is comprised of school officials, that any guidance that was issued would be trauma-informed, but it's an important enough point that we think it should be um, addressed in legislation. Um, if you turn the page um, to the fifth comment, we did not understand um, why there wasn't a policy required um, for independent schools. And I listened to um, Ms. St. James differentiate between the requirement, um, at least it was as uh, she was um, following up on the uh, administration's proposal. Um, there are places in law that um, independent schools are required to adopt policies. Um, and uh, this comment, which was put here by uh, Ms. Zaglowski references a few of those places. So um, irrespective of uh, the question, it seems like there needs to be resolution to whether the requirement will be for policies followed by procedures and practices or not. Um, but that was something that we noticed. We didn't understand why there was a differentiation, particularly because in other places in statute there is no differentiation. Um, the sixth comment, I think, is also um, substantive because the reference in the bill is to other educational institutions, and it references specifically, I'll say, the upper end of educational institutions in Vermont, universities or colleges, but it's silent on early childhood education centers. Mm -hmm. So we know that, um, we, you know, we, knew, we know through the tragedy of, uh, what's transpired in this country that um, child care settings and pre-Ks are susceptible to um, violent acts as well. So we weren't sure whether that consideration was given by the Agency of Education, but we think it's one that is a good question. Um, comment number seven um, is explicit in that it requires uh, school districts to um, have all hazards emergency operations plans but there's no similar requirement for approved or recognized independent schools. When you consider um, what all hazards are, it's a comprehensive treatment that is intended to address, you know, to put it in layperson's terms, all forms of hazards. And we wondered why, well, we, we actually didn't wonder why. We, think, we thought it was an oversight. Um, Do you mind if I ask the, the administration right now, I think? Was that in over the independent school piece, do you mind weighing in on that, or would you prefer to, to wait? Uh, I prefer to wait. Sure, absolutely. But I'm leaning in that direction. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay so so that was something that we noticed that yeah. it was the, uh, because I mean, if you consider any type of hazard, this event, it can happen at, at any place yeah. at any time. Um, our comment number eight, um, uh, it just indicates, it, it affirms the fact that um, the, all the emergency operations plans should be driven by a template. So in contrast to the, um, the, um, the options-based drills. Um, 
Number nine is just a suggestion that we've made for clarity um, in terms of the, the way the, um, the collection of entities that are responsible. And in this case, um, access control and visitor management um, talks about not only school sites, but also supervisory union and supervisory district offices. So we wanted to make sure that the language um, at the top of that 1484A was consistent with that. Um, our comment 10 um, also asks why, if the public schools and school districts are required to have a policy, why um, the independent schools would only have procedures when we know that in some instances the independent schools do have policies. Um, comment number 11, um, let me just take a look at that. Oh, so in the, in the draft of the bill, and this is also substantive, that came from the administration, there was a very specific explanation of the composition of the, um, the school crisis, uh, excuse me, of the um, Vermont School Crisis Planning Team. Um, and in particular, the, excuse me, the Behavioral Threat Assessment Team. So when we delved into that, what we heard from uh, school officials was that um, behavioral threat assessments are really situation specific events in schools. And even if you've got an assemblage of people, you might not deploy all those people on a specific threat assessment. So because we're uh, relying on guidance from the Vermont School Safety Center and the Vermont School Crisis Planning Team, we think that it would be sufficient to have the composition of the team laid out in the guidance. Because the guidance should presumably not only talk about the composition of the team, but how you respond to different behavioral threats by deploying your assessment team. So it's a long-winded way of saying, we think rather than specify the composition of the team in law, we should rely on guidance from the expertise of the Vermont School Safety Center. Um, and then finally, the last comment um, is on the very back page, and it's the 12th comment. And we, we didn't understand why if sections, and this could just be a drafting um, aspect that we don't understand, if sections one and three are covered in B, and sections two and four are covered in, um, in uh, C, why you would need um, A. And, um, as is sometimes the case, and Sue, if, if uh, the chair will allow it, I want to turn to you here. We had talked about the fact that school districts, and this is not in the comments, school districts would be hard pressed to um, adopt a policy on some of these matters by August 1, 2023, just based on the timing. So um, in the spirit of getting this legislation passed and cooperating with timely passage, um, I think we want to suggest that that August 1, 2023 be changed to September 1, 2023. And it would be a logical question for you to ask, well, can these things still be put into place operationally? I think much of what is in this proposal could be acted upon by schools practically in terms of how they're going to go about it, um, particularly with regard to the access control. But um, it doesn't make sense to ask school districts to try to rush through their policy process if functionally it would be very challenging um, to, con to complete by, 2020, by July 1, 2023. So I think we wanted to make a suggestion that that be September 1, 2023. Correct, in subsection B. Right. Yes. And we did not have a note on that, is that correct? Right. Okay. So that's, that's, thank you for allowing me to go through that. Ms. St. James, do you see anything that's sort of uh, outside of the policy decisions that you find objectionable or concerns with? No. No, okay. And do you want me to explain the effective date? Please. That's St. James Office of Legislative Council. Every section has to have an effective date. Oh. So the um, effective date section also needs to have an effective date. Usually you see that all incorporated where it says this whole act is effective on such and such a date. 
that effective date on July 1, 2023 could be folded into subsection B or C, mm -hmm. um, but there wasn't direction on this, and just to be safe, making the effective date effective as soon as is possible allows everything else to follow from it. So you can certainly change that depending on the committee's pleasure, but the effective date section needs an effective date. Um. I'm going to make a note of that because I would not want to forget that little detail. Right, right, right. right. I have to notice it. So could everything up oh, is right, right. Yeah, we have the McClure Foundation starting soon. Yes. Uh, we'll, of course, this is an ongoing conversation. But yes, please introduce so, yourself. Jay Nichols, yeah. Executive Director of Vermont Principals Association. So could we just have everything start on September 1st other than the July 1, 2024 piece of that? Or does that take care of that? It's a policy yeah, yeah, question. I was asking, well, is that okay? Legally, yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Let's note for the record that I didn't ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> Committee, any pressing questions right now in terms of suggest the suggestions? I mean, just strike me all as logical. I think we need to hear now from the administration, which we will in the next few days. If that works for the administration, I want the NEA to come back in and, and sort of respond to some of this. But I appreciate your efforts on it. Sure. Yeah. And if you'd like, I can send him the link to this, that. and that would he be can great. provide. It's yeah. really very interesting. That would be great. I, okay. It, we might even have the author in. If that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it would, the the um, sponsors are the National Association of School Psychologists. Yeah. And also the um, National Association of School Resource Officers. So I, you know, I took note of it and learned more in the. Yeah, you know, I learned more in the first two pages than I knew about the subject. So thank you. And just a reminder to everybody watching here or, or remotely, all of our bills have to make crossover. So we really do have we still have a considerable amount of time, and we will make our way through this and our other bills, you know, bit by bit, in order to make it to evacuation day, which is. March 17th, also known as St. Patrick's Day. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Thank you all for your Is it pronounced Weir? Yes, it is. Thank you. Ms. Weir, please join us. I know we've Thank said you. hello in the past. You've been before this committee. It's great to see you. Good to see you as well. This is the first time I've been in the State House in person in a very long time. It yeah. feels good. Uh, great. So I'm good to be here. Are. So the reason we asked you here is the Clerk Foundation has made a tremendous uh, gift and incredibly generous to our community colleges. We have, without a doubt, changed the lives of a lot of kids. And it's, speaking for myself, but I think from everyone, it's greatly appreciated. And we just, so I want to say thank you to the Clerk Foundation. But I also thought it would be helpful to the community to understand why you're doing this, why you've done it, where things are at. Also know a little bit about the McClure Foundation and your work. So with that, uh, the floor is yours. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, so for the record, my name is Carolyn Weir. I'm with the McClure Foundation. I serve as executive director. Um, and I want to thank you for inviting me to testify. And thank you as well for the really meaningful investments that you all have made in the affordability of college and career training in recent years. Um, we have seen such an astounding demand for the range of public investments on that front, everything from the critical occupation scholarships to the free course incentives to 802 opportunities. Um, and the very first message I have is just celebrating all of the public and philanthropic investments in the affordability of college and career training in recent years. Um, so for the benefit of committee members who may not be familiar with the McClure Foundation, we are a near 30-year affiliate of the Vermont Community Foundation. And we've spent the past 15 years exclusively focused on building um, uh, pathways to Vermont's most promising jobs. Uh, our grant making supports um, uh, the viability and um, the sustainability of uh, Vermont's public college and career training systems, and our grant making makes the Vermont-based education and training um, programs that lead to Vermont's most promising jobs more visible, more accessible, more affordable. Some of you may know us from um, the actual list of Vermont's most promising jobs. This is uh, an eight-year partnership that we have running with the Vermont Department of Labor. Um, I'll pass some of these out. Um, we update this list every um, two years in partnership with the ELMI team at the Department of Labor. Um, and taking a look at- Put one more. <coughs> yes, please. Put one on the file. Good. Yeah. 
um, taking a look at um, your agenda for later this afternoon, it might yes. interest the committee to point out that the new data points to public school teachers as the promising job that pays above the state median wage associated with the greatest number of projected openings over the next 10 years. If I may say something about that while you're on the topic, the reason we're having VSAC back in is we've been trying to pull apart what do the numbers actually look like if you arrive here or you're here already, a recent graduate from the Vermont institution, ready to teach school. And something that I pulled apart over the weekend a little bit was in terms of state dollars, it's zero. It's all federal. Like if this works out, you can, but in terms of our state investment, in term, you know, with helping teachers, transition into this state or reduce their student debt, and I think Marilyn's going to confirm this this afternoon, we're not doing anything. And as we start to look at attracting teachers through our Vermont uh, campaign for, you know, to teach in Vermont, are there things that we can do? Thank you for the inquiry. I'm thrilled to hear it. We are, in many ways, what I'd call a pathways agnostic career pathways and workforce yeah, development yeah. funder informed by this broad list of jobs. But the specific question about the role for both philanthropic and public funding in supporting the development of Vermont's teacher workforce is of real interest to us right now as well. Senator Kula. Uh, oh, sorry, no. Oh, okay. No, sorry. Um, so uh, I'll just mention that we have. Um, uh, you know, our grant making really does aim to strengthen Vermont's public college and tra career training systems, and we recently pledged a minimum of $5 million in grants over five years toward that end. Um, and much of that is centered with the Community College of Vermont and the students they serve. So that's really what I'm here to talk about today. Why CCV is our cornerstone partner, uh, what we're doing to support CCV and its students, and what impacts and insights are being generated through that support that may be of interest to you in this committee. Um, so we zeroed in on our mission about 15 years ago when we became concerned um, about how few high school graduates are being supported to continue on directly to college and career training. You've all seen that data. The latest version of the data offers continued cause for concern. So two weeks ago, the New England Secondary Schools Consortium um, came out with the latest data on post-secondary continuation rates, and both in the aggregate and disaggregated by gender, race, income status, disability status, Vermont is still the lowest in New England. Um, fewer than half of all Vermont high school students right now are transitioning directly to college. Fewer than a third of their low-income peers are doing the same. Um, so, great right, given. Which I should just to add also, it is, you know, historically, it's a bragging point that we have a high graduation rate, mm -hmm. but after that, it really does drop off in terms of what people <coughs> you know, pursue. Yes. Okay. And we connect that long standing trend to the fact that Vermont also has, I think, the highest uh, poverty rate among young adults in New England, and obviously at a time when there are great jobs. Um, available but folks without the skills and credentials those jobs require so we sorry for clarification i think i missed what you said about the third i got the half what was the third? it's about a third of um, students from low-income backgrounds um, who are graduating from high school and continuing directly on to college and then the amount of folks who graduate from college is also troubling but that's a whole other topic mm -hmm. yeah can you finish that whole thing out finish it out yeah. yeah, yeah, they don't graduate. Yeah. So we're committed to this work because we really do believe that affordable college and career training options delivered at scale is the single greatest lever for driving economic mobility um, and workforce development. That's our primary entry point for all of this work. Um, and that belief really points us to a clear institutional partner for our grant making, and that's the Community College of Vermont. Um, for good reason, right? Nationally, community colleges are engines of economic mobility, so too is CCV. It's our state's access institution and it's our state's gateway institution. CCV serves the greatest number of Vermonters and the greatest number of low-income Vermonters of any college in the state. And from what I've read, the majority of students who benefited from public scholarship and free tuition opportunities um, that were publicly funded actually enrolled at CCV during the pandemic. Um, 
So all to say, we think that institutional partner matters. If you're aware or have any background on our support for CCV, you most likely know about one or both of our two public pandemic era commitments. The first was our graduation gift to the entire Vermont high school class of 2020 of one free course of their choosing at CCV. Um, I testified to this committee back in 2021 um, about the impacts and insights generated by that promise. It essentially doubled the number of recently uh, graduated high school students enrolled at community college at a time when nationally new enrollment at community college was plummeting by double digits. So that commitment taught us a lot. It taught us about the value of hope and simplicity as design values for kind of big plays that are intended to inspire enrollment. Um, it taught us about the importance of the right institutional partner, right? CCV was ready to serve and we went from idea to launch with the governor in I think 10 days. Um, and also about the necessity of support beyond tuition. Not only um, institutional support for enhanced student services, but also institutional support to promote and administer and evaluate um, the initiative. So those lessons layered onto essentially a decade of lessons um, that we have picked up from supporting the equitable and meaningful implementation of the Flexible Pathways Bill, Act 77 from 2013, um, led us to our second commitment, and I think that's what I'm really here to talk about today. So last April, um, we announced a promise to the entire Vermont high school classes of 2023, 2024, 2025, and 2026 of a free degree at CCV, any degree program that they're choosing, through the state's early college program. So um, you all know the state's early college program is part of the Flexible Pathways Bill that allows high school seniors the opportunity to enroll um, in a full three years worth of college courses in lieu of their traditional senior year of high school. Um, we made this promise because we believe young people in Vermont deserve affordable pathways to college degrees and deserve to be able to count on those pathways early enough in high school to be able to plan. Um, our um, free degree promise through early college basically says for everyone who completes early college at CCB and is interested in continuing at CCB towards an associate degree, we've got your second year, along with living stipends each semester and enhanced academic and career advising. So, so to really be clear, let me just have, so you do your senior year through CCB, mm -hmm. all the classes, and then your commitment is to do year two. Exactly. Year two. Wow. Also known as like year 13. Right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, what that essentially means is a pathway to a free, fast-tracked associate degree through a state program, through the state's early college program, um, in any degree pathway offered at CCB that students choose. So I'm really excited to tell you a little bit more about the early impacts and insights of this promise. Right, We launched in April, and now the first early college cohort at CCB that enrolled with the benefit of knowing that they could count on um, a free degree um, at the end of their early college year is currently uh, taking courses and being supported by CCB. But before I get to that, um, I wanted to note that the two public commitments to CCB from the McClure Foundation that I've mentioned today, so our, our grad gift to the class of 2020 and the free degree promise through early college, are complemented by over a decade of more behind the scenes institutional supports to CCB. And that ranges from um, secondary education programming, um, support that resources the middle school access days and introduction to college and careers that President Judy mentioned in this room two weeks ago, um, to educational advising um, and courses delivered at Northern State Correctional Facility that um, I love this story because it helped pave the way for CCB securing two federal investments to scale incarcerated community um, college here in Vermont. I think it's a nice example of philanthropy assuming uh, early stage risk and giving a trusted partner room to test and learn and build confidence um, in public partners to scale an idea or a program. Um, we've also provided longtime support for veteran and military connected student services at CCB um, and things like enhancing career learning opportunities for CCB students in ways that align with the the guided pathways, best practices for community college delivery nationally. And in all of that work, CCB has really proven themselves to be an institutional partner that is responsive and creative um, and just ready to serve. So I will um, 
turn to the early impacts and insights generated by our free degree promise. We have a handout that I think you also have access to. Um, you. But if you'd like another, oh, thank you. If you'd like another copy, it's here. So I've already explained the structure of the three degree promise. I wanna spend a moment on why we made this promise and what we're starting to see in terms of the early impacts and what we're starting to learn from it. Um, so the why here is, you know, I've already mentioned, it's hope. Young people deserve to feel hopeful about their futures in Vermont and pathways to affordable degrees. Um, and also opportunity, right? Community colleges really are engines of economic mobility. Um, and so to center universal college degree program at our state's access institution, our state's gateway institution makes sense. Um, and Vermont's future, right? These are fast-tracked pathways to affordable degrees. We see that as good for the students who can benefit from the pathway, but also good for Vermont at a time when promising jobs are waiting to be filled. Um, we really believe that the state's early college program, which we see as underutilized, has potential to lead to um, a highly supportive free degree pathway. Uh, okay, so we're starting to see enrollment patterns at early call, the early college program at CCV shift for the better. Um, CCV is currently serving its largest early college uh, cohort since the program was launched in 2014. The cohort represents about 90% of Vermont's high schools, which we're really excited to see. Um, about 42% of that cohort are identified as low income by their school counselor and the headline for me is that that represents a really significant increase in the percentage of the early college cohort at CCV that identifies as low income. Our North Star goals here, even though the program is designed to be universal access, is that the students who stand to benefit the most, um, students who have historic and economic barriers to attaining your degree are the ones who are most supported to access and succeed in this pathway. Um, we're also seeing that the percentage of first generation students, the percentage of students who identify as BIPOC are higher than the K-12 population. And uh, you know we have the benefit of learning through the enrollment process that 65% of this cohort intend to continue at CCV after their early college year, and that's more than double the percent of early college completers at CCV who typically persist um, at CCV towards their associate degree. So that's a pretty big shift. We are, um, we're hopeful that means more young people who are choosing to stay in Vermont because they're hopeful about their futures here, and more young people with a credential that they can put to use quickly in the job market. I just wanted to add one thing I don't think is on um, this sheet. It's something, an observation that I made when I was teaching high school, which is um, folks have heard me say that our educational model is very much based on sort of an industrial revolutionary model um, or system, and it doesn't have a lot of flexibility. But this, the early college really speaks to those kids who are kind of ready after three years to be done with high school and move on to something else. And, it just built such a nice niche for those kids. Uh, other kids need five or six years, but there are those who yeah. are ready to be out sooner, and I, I love that about this program. Thank you for saying that. We yeah. really support the spirit and intent of the Flexible Pathways Bill, right? Passed by this body in 2013 that um, I think reflects that understanding really well in articulating such a wide range of flexible pathways to and through high school graduation. Now, I won't sit here and pretend that we think that early college is the right pathway for all for all students. I do think it's underutilized relative to the number of students for whom it is a great choice, um, and especially among uh, low-income students, BIPOC students, young men, students with disability. Um, because we are know, we do know that there are a number of high school seniors who are checked out, who are disengaged, who are ready for the next step, and who are really hungry for their next step. And if we can make that next step clear and supportive for them, um, I think that serves them and it serves it serves Vermont. Can you give us a set the dollar a sense of the dollars that this investment is costing the McGurk Foundation? You know, this is a learn as we go. Yeah. Um, yeah, from our perspective, a promise is a promise. So. No matter how many students enroll, we are committed to covering that second year. Um, the 
there is a fixed cost associated with administration, promotion, and evaluation of the initiative and building CCB's capacity to support this special population of 18-year-olds, in some cases even 17-year-olds, right? Um, so that's at about 150000 a year on top of our six figures of ongoing institutional support to CCB for a range of student services and capacity needs. Um, the, the costs associated with tuition, stipends, really depends on enrollment, and we, we just don't know yet. And just to follow up, any geographic area you feel as though it might, you might not be getting the students, this might be more of a question for CCB, but getting you know, as many Rutland people as Burlington, as Bennington, do you have a sense of that? We're really curious about that as well, and okay. we don't have a strong sense okay, of it sure. yet. Yeah. Um, we just know that uh, the cohort is quite dispersed, right? So 90% of Vermont high schools. Um, I have to imagine that there are some Region, there's some regional gaps in representation that we need to be attuned to. And what that dispersed cohort also means, and we're hearing this directly from students, CCB has actually stipended a lot of feedback sessions with current students about what their experience is like and what they need so that we can adapt the pathway supports as we go. And what they're hearing loud and clearly from students is we, we crave a stronger sense of belonging among this cohort. A lot of students are taking classes online, and that's a good thing because it means the classes are accessible, um, but they're hungry for more in-person events, and that's what CCV is doing right now, um, creating dedicated space for these students at large locations and creating kind of social meet and greets um, with staff. I'll just mention briefly three factors that we think are contributing to the early success of this free degree promise through the state's early college program. The first is a commitment to universal access. Um, we designed this um, promise to be um, universal because we want it to reduce the stigma of students enrolling who actually do stand to benefit the most from a free degree. Um, and that is both an important and in some ways counterintuitive design component and choice. The second, and I mentioned this already, is support beyond tuition. Um, we are providing living stipends and enhanced advising to students and directly resourcing CCB um, to deliver on you know, this, this pathway and this promise. And the third um, is leveraging public funding. This goes um, back to you all uh, with the gratitude that I started with. This promise builds on the state's early college program, which has been helping students get a jump start on their college pathway since 2014, and on recent investments in the affordability of community college like the 802 Opportunity Grant. Um, so my message to you all today is um, early signs are encouraging. We still have some time left. This was a five-year promise, and our commitment um, to all of our partners, including you all, is that we are going to evaluate how this is going and share what we're learning along the way. Um, we're also working very closely with CCB to make sure that current students are supported. Um, maybe I'll end it at that and see if you all have any questions. Any questions? Please. So, phenomenal program, uh, but curiosity question. Um, uh, it, it, it appears that uh, one of the goals is to, uh, that the students end up with a, an associate's degree. Looking through the most promising jobs, there's only two categories that even uh, have an associate's related to it. And so my question is, it's a strategic one from your perspective, what led to, what led to the decision to support associate's degrees versus CTE type or certificate based uh, qualifications so that the direction is more towards the trades versus university. I'm just wondering. I love the question. So it's um, maybe a two or three part answer. The first is that we are not a college for all funder. Part of the reason that CCB is our cornerstone institutional partner is that they offer 21 certificate programs. Um, and their certificate programs are what we consider quality. Um, high quality when it comes to the kind of Wild West landscape of non-degree credentials in the sense that they are accessible, affordable, um, oftentimes nested within degree programs. So completers of those certificates can use those courses and credits and count them towards a degree later on if that's what they choose. Um, and we also know that 
CCB, like many community colleges, really are designed to be gateway institutions. So CCB courses and degrees are easy to transfer. So a lot of the folks that we imagine are pursuing a free associate degree through this program are planning to pursue a bachelor's degree and know that their first two years are free and they have an interim credential along that pathway. Um, I will also say one of the interesting things we learned during the pandemic um, was that I think there is a, a strong interest on the part of Vermonters, especially incumbent workers, to pursuing high quality, non-degree credentials. When we launched the Vermont's Most Promising Jobs brochure back in um, the update in fall 2020, it was a, a time of extreme labor market disruption, right? People were feeling really unsafe or insecure in their jobs, a lot of folks were out of work, and it it honestly didn't feel quite as actionable to come out with a list of 50 to 60 high wage, high demand occupations like we usually do. So we paired that uh, data update with a list of seven short-term career training programs that we considered at the time best bets for Vermonters landing a promising job in 2021. Um, it was a new piece of work for us. It was done very collaboratively with a wide range of workforce development partners around the state. And the Community Foundation actually kicked in $350,000 into scholarships for those um, best bet career training programs and capacity uh, investments to the programs themselves. So for example, um, contributing to the nurse training program at NVU Linden. Um, as I understand it, that short list of seven programs was one of the inputs for what became the much um, more comprehensive list of critical occupation scholarships. And I've been thrilled to see um, the state support the affordability of these non-degree credentials, many of which are conferred by institutions that can nest those non-degree credentials in degree pathways. Ms. Weir, I think we're going to have to leave it there. Great. I really appreciate it. Uh, we know how to contact you if you have follow-up questions. We have follow-up questions. Can't thank you enough for everything that the McClure Foundation is doing. And I'm sure we will be back in contact as we make our way through some of these needs, such as teachers, uh, to see if there might be additional ways, if I dare ask, to partner. Thank you so much for the invitation. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Professor Feldman. How are you? Math <coughs> expert, tax expert. I'm good. Please. How are you? Good. Taxes? Wait, oh, fact and taxes for a few minutes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Jake, thanks for joining us. Uh, Mr. Feldman actually uh, saw that we were talking about this conversation and having a conversation around comparing Vermont property taxes to peer states and was kind enough to reach out to me uh, and say, hey, I have some data on this. I have something. So I really appreciate you coming in. Do you mind just walking us through this, sure. uh, the document, and then taking perhaps some questions? Absolutely. OK, thanks. Uh, Jake Feldman, uh, Tax Department. And there is a, um, you have it right there. Oh, you have it right there, yeah. great. It's also under my name on, on your website. Um, so this question has come up a lot at the Tax Department. Um, I think it first came up, I don't know, five or six years ago. Um, a former commissioner was wondering, well, are Vermont's property taxes high? That was the question. Um, and of course, uh, in Vermont, you have education property taxes and you also have municipal property taxes uh, on the bill. Generally, municipal taxes are about a third of education taxes, but um, you know, there's lots of personality in this state and, and those proportions vary quite a bit. Um, so um, this is a difficult thing to do. Um, Julia Richter from the Joint Fiscal Office was here about a week ago and when you um, asked her and she said, well, it's very difficult to compare and it is because um, there's such a wide range of property tax formats in different states and there's also a really wide range of relief uh, programs available. So we tried to just take a, a manageable group of states to look at. Um, we looked at uh, New England states plus New York, and we used census data um, to try to get a sense of um, you know, how sort of average, or in this case it would be median, because it's 
you know, this data you would use median as a, as a measure of, of uh, central tendency, but we looked at how median um, effective tax rates compare, um, where your effective tax rate is your total property taxes paid divided by your property value. Uh, and this data is coming from the census. Um, so there's a, a table that looks like this, and um, I can walk you through that a little bit. Um, the, the big green bar, the wide green bar, is to show um, that um, it, there's a range depending on what county you're in in a state. Um, Vermont doesn't have county level taxes, a lot of other states do. Um, but Vermont, the census does break it down by can't county. Um, and so depending on which county you're in, um, your taxes could be higher or lower. Um, and if you look at Vermont, um, we actually have a pretty tight range, which is a, a reflection of Act 60. Because um, before Act 60, the amount that you could raise for your schools was dependent on your the value of the grand list in your town, um, but Act 60 uh, disassociated that. So it, it doesn't matter how much grand list you have in your town; it's what you spend per pupil that decides your tax rate. So um, before Act 60, there was a pretty wide range of education tax rates, and that tightened up quite a bit since after Act 60. Um, apparently. Uh, Grand Isle in Vermont has the lowest effective tax rate, um, you know, on average, and this is very rough, but on average, um, and then Rutland actually has the highest. Um, not to say that taxes are the highest in Rutland County, but um, if you take taxes divided by average property value, that's how you get that 2.13% in Rutland. Um, so those are, those are some, some key takeaways from that bar chart. Um, other important things are that, um, you know, it looks like Connecticut and New Hampshire maybe have a little bit higher property taxes than Vermont, according to this data. Um, and a key consideration here is that, um, you know, the census is not digging into um, the different types of credits and exemptions that are available, but Vermont has a unique, um, a unique system where your, your property tax credit is applied to your bill. Um, it's also uh, a large, it can, can be quite large in Vermont, up to $8,000. Um, so Vermont's data here reflects after the, the property tax adjustment known as you know, income sensitivity. Um, so I would say that after income sensitivity, you know, Vermont is sort of not that high for property taxes. Uh, it's a little bit higher in this group. Um, but without income sensitivity, I think it would be further out than it is. It might be higher than Connecticut and New Hampshire. And then related to the point about property tax credits, um, we constructed a table um, so that someone could easily compare um, the different, um, the different uh, circuit breakers or relief programs that are available um, in New England and New York. Um, as I mentioned, Vermont's is kind of unique. Um, because it goes up to $8,000. Um, other states don't normally um, go that high. Um, and then our, our credit is also unique because it gets applied to the property tax bill. Um, other states, you um, gen it's generally a tax credit where you go in the spring to file your income taxes, you fill out a form, and it sort of gets blended in with the rest of your return. Um, so our, ours is unique for those two reasons. Um, it's somewhat unique um, because it's very expansive. Um, you know, it goes, it covers up to $140,000 of household income. Usually um, circuit breakers or income-based relief um, don't go that high. 
um, two thirds of the homesteads, uh, which is like a declared residence um, homeowner, um, two thirds of homesteads get uh, an income based uh, credit on their bill, which is also um, fairly unusual. And that's just about it for those graph graphics. Any questions or comments for Mr. Feldman? I really appreciate you recognizing that we were having this conversation. And uh, it's certainly something, I don't know about all of you, but constituents talk about it's, it's good for us to have some, some info um, which to answer questions or build additional conversations. Thank you, Chair. I don't know if you'll be able to answer this, and, and I, this may be a really silly question, but um, looking at Massachusetts, a state that has, you know, is often rated as having the number one public school system in the country and lots and lots of social programs, I'm just wondering what, how is it that their taxes seem lower than ours, generally speaking? I'm not totally sure. But um, these tax rates are effective tax rates, where you take the taxes divided by property right. value. It could be the case that in Massachusetts, the property <laughs> values are quite a bit higher. That's true, yeah. Um, so maybe people are paying like sort of similar tax amounts, but on you know their, their property values are maybe huh. quite a bit higher. They also have economies of scale that we don't have, so I, I get that point too, but it's just still pretty surprising, I guess. Any other questions or observations for Mr. Feldman at this point? Jake, thanks again. This is really helpful. Us, did you follow? No, no, no. just give him a thumbs up. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Once you get the thumbs up, then the committee usually is finished. So. <laughs> uh, thank you. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. Okay, let's take a five minute break and come back, and we'll hear from Dr. Boucher at uh, 2 35. Back to Senate Education, Tuesday, February 7, 2 35. Committee, last year, maybe it was the year before, but maybe last year we passed Act 67, the community, was it the year before? The year before, thank you. Community Schools Grant. And I can just speak from some personal experience. Uh, years ago, a uh, school in my district, Molly Stark, elementary school had wraparound services. And to stomach degree, they still have some of those services. But back at one point, they had a, a dental chair right, right at the school. They had you know, a physician. You could really get the services that you needed. A kid could get the services that they needed. And I think parents could, in some ways, also access some of those services. And as we're looking to see how can we improve education in Vermont, one of the things that keeps coming back to us is are things like school nutrition, making sure you don't have a toothache, making sure that mental health is being taken care of, all of those things. So I asked Dr. Boucher to come in and talk a little bit about the community schools grant program that we passed, where things are, what schools are uh, benefiting from this, how schools got to getting these grants, how many applications, that sort of thing. We did it as a pilot, and these are federal funds, uh, and eager to learn uh, where things stand. So with that, welcome. Sure. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Heather Boucher, Deputy Secretary for the Agency of Education, and I am very pleased to be here in person. It's wonderful to see you all. I really enjoy testifying in person much more than virtually so I'm glad we have that option now. It's amazing the difference it can make. It really is. It, it is. really yeah. is. Um, I was going to start with a funny joke about my name which I guess I'll do. Um, not that this is a non-serious affair but the reason I actually seem very snooty and use Heather A. Boucher is because there actually is another Heather Boucher PhD who happens to be an economist and is in the Biden administration. Um, Earlier in my career, her um, doctoral uh, institution tried to give me her, an award for her, and I had to tell them, I'm not that person. Yes, you are. No, oh I'm really not. I didn't go to the new school for my PhD. I know that I went to the University of Denver. Well, we actually invited the person from the Biden administration today, so you're not. <laughs> oh my God! You are not shaped. Okay. No. All right. So now, now I got. All right. Yeah. All right. It's fine. While you're here. Isn't that funny? <laughs> though? It is not a 
typical name. Yeah. I don't it is. No, it, it is not it's a true. typical yeah, name. To get it all also. Yeah. 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 So. But well, we're glad you were with us. Thank you, and I'm really glad to be here. So I thought, um, I, I hope you had a chance to, I think, um, yeah. Senator Hashim, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, I see that you were able to take a look at, or at least get it. Um, I sent it a little bit late this morning. So I had prepared a PowerPoint, and um, I will just walk you through kind of a high level um, conceptual um, description of what this program is all about. Um, I'll give you some updates as um, Mr. Chair asked, and then I certainly um, am open for any and all questions. So I thought it would be best, um, I don't know if we have actually come in yet and talked about education recovery domains and how we actually had set that up. So these are um, how we conceptualize education recovery resulting from where do we go after um, experiencing the pandemic. So um, it's really critical um, for us when we're actually talking about what um, largely our ARP ESSER funds are, um, are uh, funding. And so those are the federal dollars that um, back a lot of our state level initiatives. Um, and I think, uh, Mr. Chair, has Jill come in yet to give an overview of ESSER? She has. Okay. Yeah, she so, did give an overview great. Yes, yes. So, the distinction between the LEA, the local education agency, which is the districts, mm -hmm. and then the SEA, which is the state education agency, and the um, set aside that we have, some of which is mandated, some of which is more discretionary. So, the three domains that we really focused on um, in terms of our uh, recovery plan are academic achievement. And we like to think of that um, more colloquially as unfinished learning. Um, there was some discussion a couple of years ago about, you know, when you talk about um, a lack of learning, you talk about learning loss, it's really, really tough for kids to hear that, it's tough for parents, so let's talk about that it's unfinished learning. Um, probably, you know, we needed to recalibrate what we were trying to learn and, and um, how we were going to do that. Social emotional learning and wellness, um, social emotional learning, SEL, I'm trying to help you with the education speak here and the acronyms. Um, because we've been talking about it in terms of social emotional learning and wellness, if you hear us in education, the agency say so, that's what that means. <laughs> so that one's really quite interesting. So I thought I'd, I'd uh, make sure that I note that for you. And then also student and family engagement. So we, we crafted those through a variety of stakeholder engagement exercises. Um, it kept holding up time and time again that those were the three buckets we wanted to really focus on in terms of how we were going to deploy our uh, federal um, COVID dollars. So one of the initiatives um, that um, was um, identified in Act 67, as Mr. Chair pointed out, was community schools. And so I'm going to walk you through. Uh, Mr. Chair did a really nice job of teeing me up for uh, what are community schools. And then I'll um, tell you a little bit more about um, what it looks like in Vermont um, as a result of uh, this funding um, opportunity. So community schools are both the place, so a hub, a place in the community, and they're also um, partnerships. So they're also how is that school and the folks that work in that school building sustainable partnerships in the community, all to ensure that kids have um, what they need to do well in school, but also that they have um, nutrition, they have health, um, um, all kinds of things. They have extended learning opportunities. That's another big piece. So um, these are just some different conceptualizations um, that have been put forth um, in this space. Um, as I said, community hubs, uh, learning, service provision, um, community engagement, and then a big core piece is equity for all learners because as Mr. Chair pointed out, um, citing Molly Stark School as an, as an exemplar, an early exemplar in Vermont, um, often uh, this, the communities that need these kinds of models the most are those that are the most underserved, that have um, the most challenges in terms of um, uh, nutrition, um, typically um, some of our more um, uh, high poverty areas, more and more in Vermont, I would say, um, areas that have um, challenges in the community with um, drug addiction, um, those kinds of um, issues going on. So in Vermont, we actually um, adopted five pillars um, consistent with national literature on how to think about um, what are the core pieces embedded in a community schools model. So you have integrated student supports, 
And those can be anything from um, supports for student learning, so the traditional academic um, learning that we think of, supports for social emotional learning, um, supports for mental health and wellness, um, supports for medical wellness. Um, uh, dentistry is often um, a really common um, theme in um, community schools and offering that, um, particularly for families, of course, who don't have transportation. So we know that they're getting their children to school and that can be where their children then get uh, medical and dental services. And then how are all of those integrated together? So really at the core of the community school idea is something else called the whole child uh, concept. And you can see that from um, what I'm talking about, which is it isn't just, I like to say, we don't, it, it isn't thinking about, um, which no one does, but thinking about students as little you know, brains on feet. This is really about thinking of them as whole human beings and how we actually make sure that they have everything they need um, in order to effectively learn. Um, very often we talk about expanded or um, enriched learning opportunities. Um, so nationally uh, there is, um, through the federal government, some funds available that really aligns community schools very nicely with after school um, 21C funding. Um, it makes sense because um, 21C funding is, um, you know, it's really, um, 21C funding is for the same types of schools I'm going to talk about in a sec um, to be served. And then also um, it is kind of that link between after, you know, what happens when the school day, the, the traditional school day is over and students are getting ready to enter into their community, whether that's home or um, an after, you know, another kind of experience. So it makes a lot of sense that they're um, aligned together. Um, Active family and community engagement is a critical pillar. Um, it's, it's really um, the reason that community schools tend to look unique and different from each other is that they are, because they're really taking into um, consideration what the particular community they're set up needs. Um, and so um, they're really, those that are doing it best are actually engaging in active family um, communication, family collaboration. They're inviting in families that in more traditional settings are not usually, um, they don't feel welcome um, to school board meetings or to um, um, different kinds of um, school um, events. So that's a really big piece um, that the most effective community schools do. Collaborative leadership and practices, and we're going to talk a little bit about what that looks like specific to Act 67. And then again, equity, and how do we make sure that um, schools are safe, they're inclusive um, for all of our students, so that all of our students, no matter their background, um, their language, um, all kinds of um, ways to think about um, our um, wonderful diversity um, in our student body. So um, how do we make sure that all students are actually um, learning effectively and supported? Should I go through the entire thing, Mr. Chair, or pause for questions? It, it's this community is great. If questions pop up, they hands will go up. Perfect. Thanks. Great. So uh, App 67 indicated kind of um, a corollary to what I'd already said about um, the communities that we're trying to serve with community schools. So the eligibility criteria that we used um, here in Vermont were that um, the student body of the school that was going to receive grant funds um, had to have at least 40% of the students eligible for free and reduced lunch. Um, or they had to be identified for what we call comprehensive or equity support. And that's language that's from our federal um, education um, plan. So it has to do with, um, you've probably heard of something called title schools. So that's really what that kind of means. So these are schools that have qualified um, through our um, accountability process at the state level to um, need and will get um, additional supports um, for students. Questions on that? So we really, I, I think that's important because we really did try to narrow in partnership, um, of course, with um, the General Assembly. We really did try to narrow this um, funding opportunity to those districts, uh, LEAs, and schools that really had high need. Um, so the total fund was about $3.4 million. These were ARP ESSER funds, which was from the third tranche of funding um, that you're probably quite familiar with now. Um, there are three years of funding, so they will end uh, fiscal year 24. So um, not much time left. We're about two thirds of the way through, a little bit more than that. And um, so they'll end um, officially 
the end of the fiscal year, and then there's usually about three months where um, the funds can um, still retroactively pay for things that had already been um, encumbered. So um, we have one more academic year is what I'm saying, um, one more. So, so that's where I come up with one and a half and kind of halfway there. Make sense? Yeah. Okay. So there were uh, five um, awards. I believe we had six applicants, um, and one of the applicants um, did not follow um, the directions. I'd have to go back and, and look at um, why. So there was something missing in the application. I'd have to go back and look at that. Just out of yes. curiosity. Yeah. Who, who was the uh, six? I'd have to go back and oh, look. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't have that information. So Did you help recognize for, for school? I mean, one of my concerns was I noticed that there were a number of schools that I thought would should get these dollars that didn't get these dollars. And sometimes I worry that those schools and those districts don't have the resources to be writing grants, et cetera. And I remember Secretary of French sitting here yep. and us saying, I bet you could identify, Mr. Secretary, those schools that need this the most. And would you say this reflects the schools that need this the most, or are these the, this the gang that um. has the wherewithal to put together a good application? I think these schools represent some of our most needy regions. Um, all of them, no. Okay. Um, and I think we did um, certainly uh, reach out to schools um, that met the criteria that were specified in the law. Um, as you'll see, we've provided significant supports um, to directly to the schools once they've been um, allotted the funds. I don't know if you'll recall, Mr. Chair, but I actually didn't think we'd get any applications because of the timing of this. Okay. So but I was you, thrilled. I vaguely do remember yeah, that. because yeah. this was during the first year of COVID. Right. Uh, the second year, excuse me. And so I was thinking from everything that I've been hearing that we wouldn't get any applications. And so we did, and we were pretty excited about okay. that. Um, I do believe um, North Country, um, the um, superintendent at that time, um, John Castle had come yeah. in strong support of this funding opportunity, and um, he his district was awarded the funds um, to serve all 12 of their schools um, in um, that Northeast Kingdom um, district. So it's always um, it's always a challenge. Uh, we tried also to make um, this application easy peasy, like it it, it wasn't you know. Uh, superfluous pages of text and those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, so we really were trying to pay attention to that. We still have to follow um, grant procedures and you know, just like we have to follow procurement procedures um, aligned with like, but we did, um, we did have some, um, you know, where, where we could have some flexibility in terms of the ease of the application, which we did, we actually took advantage of that, so. So, and I know you'll get to some of this, but so people receive their funds, they start to follow the plans that they put forward in the application. One of the concerns, and I'd say complaints, two years ago was, okay, limited funding, these schools get a few years to do this, money is going to disappear. Are there going to be, uh, I mean, one thing I guess I'm wondering, are there going to be, we will have lessons learned from mm -hmm. this process where you'll come out and say, all right, this is, this is feasible in other schools, but with this cost, that kind of thing? Yeah, I think okay. so. Um, we actually, and I'll talk a little bit in just a sec, we do have, um, compared to our other grant yeah. um, programs, this one has a much um, more um, high touch in terms of the grantees. And so we meet uh, with them quarterly, with every single grantee quarterly, and we meet, we have um, two annual meetings where we bring all of the grantees together and we um, host um, some work uh, to kind of think about common themes and you know what they've garnered um, themselves from this process. Um, and so I think we could easily, and we, we usually do, um, share you know, in our final report some of those pieces. I think um, the idea of, I think, the fiscal cliff is something that's on everyone's mind, and it's certainly on our mind. It's also the fiscal cliff in this case being all of those federal dollars and what happens to the programs that we funded. Um, so I think, I think we will need to continue um, trying to figure out 
if we're going to invest funding, um, where we invest those, because yeah. this has been a really huge influx of funding for our tiny little state. Um, the bulk of which is at the local level. So I think um, I'm hearing much more about the challenge of at the local level, this money is going away. So how are we going to keep these folks yeah. on that we've? Um, Same way. It ends in fiscal year 24. Yes. That means the program. How long do they have before they can? They have to have the money spent. Did you find that any of these schools didn't have a plan? They. they oh no, they all did have a plan. Okay. Yep. And well, they're all on track for spending are, their okay. money. Yep. So it has to be spent by the end of fiscal year. 24? It has to be. It has to be encumbered oh, by the end of fiscal okay. year. So there is a, with most federal grants, there's about a 90 day period where if you've encumbered, which means you have a contract, right. you have something, yeah. you've, you've already set it, some, you've, already, you've made an official um, plan for the money, um, then they'll allow you to retro, you know, they'll allow you to keep the money for three months to fund that. Do you, do you think that there are schools that don't have a plan? They, they, they have needs, but they haven't sat down and actually plan. If, it, if, if some, uh, a dump of money came in yeah. that they could they would prepare be prepared in the future to do this? Well, I think um, not of these schools because right. that's the beauty of having to go through even a, a simplified grant right. process. Like it requires them to have to, to sit and think about this. I think, um, you know, the scenario that you're talking about, um, Senator Williams, is um, perhaps more in line with what happened when the local dollars from um, ESSER were just suddenly needing to be um, thought about, um, planned for, developed, and then spent. And so I think we try very hard as a state to um, have the, um, all LEAs do needs assessments and to really guide them on what are you going to do with these funds. Um, I think it's still ongoing, um, and I'm going to show you a little bit about what the local funds looks like um, at the very end um, of the, of the uh, presentation. So one of the things I wanted to um, note is, in terms of what the funds were used for, um, in some sense this won't be surprising to you if you understand um, the concept of community schools. One of the things that is really neat, though, about, the, about Act 67 is it required um, that schools who got these grants hired a community schools coordinator. So they they had to hire a person or assign a person, um, recast a person if it was someone who was already there, um, to actually be the lead um, at that local level um, to really ensure that these partnerships are happening, to really ensure that the, the services are um, being set up um, for students. Is that the correct time? Yep, you're fine. Okay. You're, you're good. You're we're, sure? we're going okay. to make some shifts. This is important. Um, so um, I'm happy to report that all of them, which I think is really um, important, all of them have um, actually hired their community coordinator at this point, and that person is working. And that's really important because a lot of what's been happening with ESSER funds um, at the local level is a real difficulty in hiring for positions, as I'm sure you've already heard. And so they have been able to all hire their community coordinators, which I think is great. Um, and each one will have a community coordinator, and that's required. In yes, the that was required in the in our state law. Yep. So um, I'm just going to kind of uh, run through these, but um, so some of the themes of what the funds were used for: um, after school, um, building internship CTE opportunities that were more community based um, for students. Um, Enhancing effective wraparound supports for students, um, including telehealth, which in some of our rural areas um, has really um, been required um, to really meet need. Um, in uh, North Country, they actually built um, a budget um, using these funds to provide emergency food, clothing, hygiene items for all students in need. And they also have a lot of students experiencing homelessness. As many more, there are many more students um, experiencing homelessness um, throughout our state as a result of COVID. Um, they also, um, North Country did some interesting things as well as um, one of the others, I think, um, perhaps Virgins. I'd have to go back and look at the exact um, uh, school and I apologize for that, but they actually did a multi-generational um, focus where they actually were working with parents to get parents um, exposed to financial literacy, to their own education and how to actually improve that. Um, so that's actually um, really critical and important too. Again, 
this is really trying to address student need and we know that um, for students a lot of um, the pieces um, or the reasons that they are in need is that their families are in need and so it's really trying to get at that multi-generational perspective um, and then um, uh, I know in White River Junction that um, part of what they did was establish 10 partnerships with local mental and dental uh, health providers um, down there um, to really ensure that um, all of their students um, in the middle school were getting um, their uh, physical health needs met. Did you say mental health also? Yes, okay. mental and dental. So that's just something that, well, a couple things. Um, we've started taking some testimony on trauma, on mental health in schools. This is a huge, huge issue. Um, this is one way to, to start to look at it. Um, there, there are others. One thing that I'm just wondering, and actually it might be my colleagues who are in health and welfare might be able to weigh in on this, is where are we with telemental health? I met with a constituent this weekend. She happens to be a high school senior. When she's off in college, can she continue to work with the same counselor, get re you know, financially get reimbursed, even though she might be going out of state? What if you're in the kingdom, but the counselor that works best for you happens to be in Wyndham County? Do we have? Yeah, um, I think those are all really great questions. So um, what I can say about what we're doing with mental health um, is we also had a grant, um, Act 127, uh, that, that provided grants um, to uh, LEAs and other partners yeah. um, that um, allowed them to really beef up. Um, mental health supports and other supports for students. I mentioned that a little here. I'm happy to come back and talk about that. Um, telehealth um, is definitely, like I already said, and like you're talking about, Mr. Chair, something that I have seen LEAs themselves um, and engage in contracts with. In terms of the state's purview over telehealth, I'm not really sure. I mean, I think that's going to fall back on insurance and, and right. how insurance, health insurance, and how health insurance allows or doesn't allow um, providers to be, um, you know, providing um, services. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. happy to look into it. And okay. come well, back. also, I, I know that I think the House is starting it. I don't know if Health and Welfare has started it. Any conversations around that yet? No. No, it's just been touched on briefly. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was compelling this weekend to hear of a young woman who's going to probably go to college in Massachusetts, and she has a relationship with this particular therapist, and it's not easy always to get a good relationship right out the door with the therapist. It takes a little while. So how can people maintain that and also allow their insurance to continue to, to reimburse the family? And, and really what we're talking about are a bunch of different systems needing to connect and talk to each other. Because if the student is going to go to a college, a university, if she's going to be on their health insurance, which often happens for students, then who knows? I mean, like they might require that they use their providers. Right. So um, it's a very important topic. Um, I, I, don't, I just don't know when it comes to across state boundaries. I don't know what we can do as a state um, in particular when we're talking about not only even in the education system but potentially insurance. That's not my wheelhouse. <laughs> I, I'll just add the other piece that was compelling for me is a, a lot of people will talk about that personal relationship with their therapist in the room, but there, uh, this young woman really made me realize that there are a lot of people who develop a really great relationship on Zoom. Also, yeah. you know, and they feel more comfortable sitting in their home at their dinner table or in their room talking to a therapist. And so uh, there, there's some real opportunities yeah. there. I think if the, we can find a way for it to be um, continued, I mean, it's going to be better for um, the student in that case. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. let us know how we can help yeah. for sure. Um, I um, then gave you an example, it looks terrible on my handout um, because it's not color, of um, this is from Cabot School, um, just an example of um, some of the programming they're running um, just to give you um, a flavor of um, this is their after school schedule. So this was, I believe, a brand new um, after school um, opportunity for students that hadn't been available, um, I believe, before um, this funding. Um, I also received um, some information from um, the Virgins Elementary School. 
Um, this was a late breaking um, addition. I'm happy to I'll pass this around. This is um, from that um, school principal, I believe, um, or possibly their um, community school coordinator on all the things they're doing in the Virgins Elementary School. I, I literally received it as I was um, exiting the, the door to come over here. So I thought I would just print it and so bring it. You, okay. yeah. Would you say that do you know that these after school programs are directly funded by the, by, by this initiative? Um, they should, yeah, they should be. So um, I believe that this this is a new after school um, program that was actually these funds were used to underwrite the, the new program. Um, yes. Yeah. So so I was going to have a question about the five pillars um, for Act sixty seven, and you know my question was around definitions because you know these things all sound great but then I always wonder you know what what do they really mean and so this uh, so this document here so all the schools are required to provide a response um, they were an application okay, yes. awesome. that's yep. great so Thank they're you. very familiar with the five pillars that's how they really set up their applications to actually address each of those five pillars that's awesome uh, some of them did more in some than others but they had to address all five of them Thank you. Sure. Yeah, just two quick comments. Um, one is, you know, we do all, we're all concerned about our per pupil uh, number and the amount of money we're spending on education and that, and yet when you look at this and you see the expansive programs that we are providing to families and students, especially those in need, it's pretty astounding and um, just pretty incredible. And I also just wanted to bring up a point, which I, I'm sure a lot of folks are clued into which is that to do really serious like substantive outreach and um, community engagement can also be something that costs money I know um, where I live we have a we have a lot of folks who live in poverty and we decided that it's really not fair to ask them to engage in the evenings, for example, um, without some kind of recompense, because that might be a period of time when, when they kind of need to be working to make money to provide for their family. So whether it be food, childcare, or actual money, um, that is one way to really expand who we get at the table. And it's, it's worked really well, but it is an added expenditure. So you have that expenditure? You have in what district? We do that in Burlington. Yeah. So, for example, if a family uh, member, somebody because of all these circumstances you just mentioned, needs to or everybody wants that person at a meeting, they might get paid to be at that meeting. Yeah, yeah. When we have some groups, um, community, um, I can't remember the name of the group, but something like a student community engagement group that meets once every couple months in the evenings, and it's made up primarily of new American families, and we usually provide some food and. Yeah. Some, some kind of a stipend. And same with, we have some really great student groups that meet in the summer, and they also get a stipend for engaging in that work. So I know some of the um, schools up in the kingdom as well um, offer uh, laundry. I've heard that too. So yeah. they offer, um, they have washers and dryers for That's families too at the school. So, and it gets them to come in and, yeah. um, you know, there's no shame in it or there's reduced shame. Um, yeah and a pantry, um, food pantry, yeah. Um, There's something I first about having that food pantry right at the place of work, whether it's a pantry or a store, mm -hmm. but being able to leave and pick things up as you leave yeah. and make it, like you're saying, very normalizing. Yeah. Mom said, you need to pick up this on my way home out of school, and they just happen to have it there, and it's reduced costs, and we'll keep it open to everybody. Yeah, I think really when you put that in their new school design, like I think it's they built right. that into their new construction. Yeah, some kind of school. Yeah, yeah. it's very cool. So I'm almost done. I just wanted to end with um, not community schools, but just to, um, tee up or at least um, let um, the committee members know about other um, related initiatives. One of which I've already referenced um, that are funded um, through. Um, the three, uh, primarily the second and the third uh, tranche of um, state set aside uh, ESSER dollars. So in terms of mental health, this was Act 127 of last session. Um, so two and a half million dollars um, for 
another set of LEA grants um, in addition to these community school grants uh, that are for specifically related to um, building um, sustainable mental health supports. Happy to come back in and talk about those. Um, they're not the same. Um, they're not. They're not exactly the same schools. Um, so I think that would be um, unique and interesting for the committee to hear about. We are currently um, in the process of identifying uh, a vendor to provide supports for educators um, in terms of mental health. So this was also part of 127. And I can't talk too much about that because we are literally um, reviewing bids. So. <laughs> Just a quick question for the uh, Universal School Meals. Um, I know last year the price tag I think was 29 million, and the forecasted price tag is 24 million. I was wondering what the 8.4 uh, is referring to, or what. This is Universal After School. This is not Universal. Oh wow! Meals. Okay. It's right. okay. Have, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a lot. The same thing. It's a lot. Okay, so I'll be right. And it's like it goes yeah, right through it. All right. Yeah. Disregard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, and we have invested a lot in after school. Um, so we invested, um, you know, uh, more than $10 million with our ESSER funds in after school. Um, and uh, the idea is that we're building a universal system of after school around the whole state. Um, and I'm happy also to come back in and talk about those initiative, that initiative. Um, we partner with Vermont After School and a bunch of other state agencies on that. Um, the set-aside mandatory amounts are interesting. So these are of our state set-aside amounts. So these are the SEA dollars that were provided. We, we were required to actually spend um, these two buckets of money on $2.8 million for after school, which is where I leaped from the 8.4 to um, over $10 million because we, we had to actually spend $2.8 um, which we found out later after we already started investing in after school, by the way, yeah. <laughs> which is OK. Like, we're all excited about, but that came later because um, there was a. It was a very um, dynamic um, situation going on in terms of rules from um, the U.S. Department of Education and all those kinds of things. So um, we were obligated to um, spend 2.8 on grants to LEAs for after school, um, ideally linked with 21C programs. Um, so it really uh, meant to expand that. And then also summer um, learning loss interventions, um, another 2.8 million. Um, and the last slide I have, which I, if you have not seen this, I think that you might find it very interesting, and I bet Jill already uh, told you about it, which is we actually have a dashboard um, that you can look at to tell you what um, the ESSER funds at the local level are being spent on. She did take us through this. Yeah, this yeah. And so, um, interestingly, I thought um, this is just the overall um, state. So it's the, the overall state depiction of what the LEAs are spending their money on. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So I was just walking you through what the state was spending its set-asides on through, throughout this whole presentation. And so, you know, I think not surprisingly, 47% is on instruction and academic supports. We would, we would um, expect that. Um, SEL and mental health supports is only 4%. And so that was a little disappointing, um, I'm going to say to me when I saw that, because we know that it is a critical, it's a critical, critical factor um, in terms of students' recovery. Maybe what's happening, though, is that we have provided supports from a state level, and so at the local level, um, they might be relying on those, and that's a good thing. So more to come in terms of that. And then, of course, uh, physical safety, operations administration um, are also um, key pieces there. So I just wanted to um, show that, and you can um, go. Uh, we have that link for you if you would like it again, and you can go look at your own your own district or your own region and see what they have um, planned to and um, are currently uh, spending their um, ESSER dollars on. Senator Twilight. Um, thank you very much, Secretary uh, Boucher. The, uh, for example, HVAC updates, would that fall into physical health and safety or would that be under operation? Where would that fall in this? Um, it would probably be under the physical health and safety, okay. which is why that one's so big, That's because those are um, expensive. Yes, and, they are. Well, and given um, 
you know, where we are as in terms of our um, housing, uh, not housing stock, well, housing student stock. <laughs> it's the same principle. So um, our school um, stock, uh, we're, we have old schools. Yeah. That's really what I'm trying to spit out. <laughs> You know, we, the, the federal government, the state, has invested a lot of money in COVID recovery. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm wondering what other things should we be thinking about? We know that schools are doing after school programs, hiring more mental health professionals, getting family engagement officers. Well, one of the, I know you're coming back in to talk to us tomorrow about a few things, and maybe we could continue that conversation around what else? What mm -hmm. else should we be thinking about? as we work on our bills to get out this year. Mm -hmm. um, I think what I've heard from some local schools is they are very worried when this money ends. They have, you know, there's a lot of recoveries happen, a lot of good things, but it's, it's gonna likely, in some cases, come to a screeching halt unless we figure out are there ways maybe that the state continues investments in those high needs mm -hmm. areas and, and, and what would that look like? Well, right, because we know one option would be that they build these um, costs into their local school right. budgets. Right. But we also know that um, there will be variability in terms of the success of that as an endeavor, because in some areas that will be um, that will be uh, voted up and, and be fine, and in other areas um, it would not uh, pass muster yeah. um, through the voting process. So I do think it's something we need to. Continue thinking about, um, as I'm sure Jill shared, um, we don't have any more money in ESSER. It's all been allocated. <laughs> so um, that, um, that uh, those funds, you know, we're now going to have to be looking if we do sp if we do work in that space, it's going to have to be, you know, state funds. Um, so, but we're happy to keep talking about that and brainstorming. Always curious about metrics. So. Does the agency track uh, some metrics related to these uh, benefits? Uh, uh, just looking over uh, the package, you know, in, in increased CTE seats or you know, lifting, uh, uh, essentially you know, lifting uh, students out of poverty, long range. I, you know, some of these. You know, they, you know, this you know this money package is this is all very recent, but you know, mm -hmm. it's a long-term effort. And I'm just curious if there's data on dollars in the programs resulting in you know the the real goal. Right? So we actually yes, Senator Weeks, we actually have um, as our recovery plan, we have a set of metrics that we'll be tracking, and, and you know that's going to be a multi-year effort um, as we look for. Um, an initial bump in the indicators that we've set set to look at, a combination of um, academic issue, academic outcomes, but also to the extent that we can capture uh, mental health and social emotional learning outcomes for students. For instance, um, we have strong partnerships in all of these endeavors across agencies within our government, and so we're often sharing um, information back and forth. If not um, individually to each other, the planning has been shared. So for instance, um, we've been partnering with AHS on a lot of those metrics because the metrics for mental health for students um, would come from AHS services. So are there dashboards available for this type of? We don't have a dashboard Something yet, like um, but we have a plan in place for how we'll actually um, track progress and track um, to make sure that um, there is a return on the investment. And I'd be happy to come back in and, and present that part of our recovery plan. Or, I think that, that would be interesting. or Secretary French could. Uh, you know, even what is the opportunities to learn a lot from this are huge. What's 10 years out look like? Mm -hmm. Are there a way to track kids? Are mm -hmm. there ways to sort of see what some of these investments, how they made, made a difference? So our schedule's filling up, but we could probably find some time next week a little bit to, to maybe or the week after to have well, this conversation. It's not, you know, pressing. And 90% of the funds, I want to say, yeah. are at the local level. So right. what we've tried to do is actually require those kinds of indicators. We're doing it as well at the state level, but the bulk of the dollars that are spent are at the local level. And so but these with dollars each that we're of, talking about right now, the wraparound, are agency dollars. The community schools yeah. grants? Yes, those yeah. are part of yeah. our set-aside. Right. Right. And, we, and, you know, as a matter of just the way we always do grants and... Um, 
contracts, we always have um, indicators of success we're looking at. So we can go back. I think that um, Senator Weeks, you had a broader question about think, not just this particular program, but about That's true. In, in general. So. I think I know I'm stating the obvious probably to everyone here, but um, if there's one thing that we've learned this year, it is um, the mental crisis, mental illness, um, not only the fact that it's, it's, it's deadly, but it's also extremely costly in, in so many realms. And I hope at some point we can shift the conversation to prevention and wellness. Um, I, it, I, I, I worry, I, I just find this all very troubling and worrying. And what is our, what's our role on the education committee and as educators and you know, folks working in the field to help long-term fix this problem? I, I'm so worried for our children. And a, and a problem in terms of some of our um, indicators of wellness or functioning mm -hmm. for our students that they were actually, even before COVID, not going in the right direction. Right. So much more anxiety, both non-clinical and clinical levels of anxiety. Right. Um, we know that um, you know we have subgroups of students that are at very high risk for suicidality, mm -hmm. and um, whether it's um, <clears throat> ideation and thinking about that or actually carrying it through. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, we would be very happy to um, you know, we, we, education has to be a part of, of yeah. how you actually come together as a community right. and as a state to actually solve yeah, solve these well, challenges. Pulling it into maybe pulling it into curriculum and sort of like you know wrapping it up in what we teach and how we teach and all of those things. Um, obviously, family is important in this and home life and etc. But mm -hmm. what is our role there? I guess. Yeah, I think one of the challenges back to. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, your question is, um, you know, we really have significant workforce challenges in every sector, and so it really does stymie our ability to actually um, invest in the way that we know we need to. So I think that is one of the challenges that's happening um, with the unused um, dollars at the local level is they, they're trying desperately to hire folks and they just can't find them and you're seeing that in all other kinds of mm -hmm. sectors as well, not just education. But I just want to follow up also about Senator Fulick's point was, you know, we're hearing later, I think this week, from physical and health educators, how do you teach health in a way that, like you're saying, gets kids, I don't know, prepares them to, to deal with all, everything that you're talking about. So it's more of a preventative piece. Mm -hmm. But that's only one tiny, tiny piece. Yeah, it's just yeah. Well, when I was teaching, I started talking a lot about the, the brain and the teenage brain. I was yeah. working with teenagers. And it was, I found it to be um, really helpful. And the kids mm -hmm. were really excited to learn about themselves in that way. because. A lot of times, you know, they don't know why they're feeling what they're feeling. That's interesting. And um, or the super, thirty things they're feeling. Yeah, exactly. It's super happening. empowering for them to know, like, this is what's happening physiologically mm -hmm. in my body and my brain. Mm -hmm. So that kind of stuff, I just hope, really, you know, gets enmeshed in our curricula at some point. That's a great point. I mean, to really understand. Well, of course, I'm feeling this way because this is where I'm at. Yeah, like normalizing, yeah. normalizing, yeah. normalizing yeah. that um, I mean, my, my specialty area is in adolescent development, so this is near to my heart, but you know, it's, um, you know, they, in many ways they revert back to being, I like to say, a toddler in terms of their emotional up and down, um, but with much more advanced cognitive skills in terms of they can out-argue most parents, <laughs> so that so can true. actually be so very, true. very confusing for um the kiddos that the teens going through that because it's kind of like I and there's a flood of like a lot of complex ideas and you know abstractions and things like that so yeah good stuff thank you, thank you. all right see you tomorrow thank you thank yes you. community we're gonna uh have we're gonna come back in about seven thank minutes you. we're gonna wrap up with Senator Chittenden's bills and testimony and then we've got Marilyn Cargill coming in to follow up on uh teacher scholarship stuff Okay. Great. Yeah. Welcome uh, back to Senate Education 335 on Tuesday, February 7th. Two final items for us to look at today. We have um, S34. This is Senator Chittenden's bill on kindergarten enrollment age. Senator Chittenden and 
that St. James took us through the bill. Thank you. I will pass out Mr. Hayden some few copies. Same bill, but we have it right now. Right So, and just to read this statement for those watching, the bill proposes to prohibit a school district from denying kindergarten enrollment to a student who will attain five years of age on or before January 1 next, following the beginning of the school year. And I, I will also hear, I know from others uh, on this topic this week, Senator Chittenden said, you know, he's got some flexibility in his thoughts on what kind of bill he would like, but I know he's looking for guidance. Just doesn't want to run into the same situation he and his wife and daughter ran into uh, where there was a lot of ambiguity, wait until the last minute, then had to hustle and send his kid at the cost of 12000 to, you know, a private early childhood center, you know, all that kind of stuff. So what can we do for Senator Chittenden? And so to answer that, we have Mr. Fisher, and Mr. Case. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Ted Fisher uh, from the Vermont Agency of Education and the agency's director of communications and legislative affairs. And I think it's this is actually my first time appearing formally yeah, behind, the, behind the seat. I'm always, I'm always in the corner. Uh, and I just want to pass the mic to my colleague, um, Director Chris Case. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, Chris Case, I'm the director of student support services. A little louder. Oh, I'm sorry about that. Okay, so can you hear me now? There you go. Yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. Um, so, uh, afternoon. Uh, Chris Case, I'm the director of the Student Support Services Division. So, this is also uh, Chris and my first time testifying joint hybrid, <laughs> joint hybrid, remote, remote, and in person. So, we're going to, we may pass the mic back and forth to each other a little bit here. Um, so I just want to preface, we've introduced two um, exhibits today. One is the Legislative Report Standardizing the Kindergarten Entrance Age, which Hayden has posted to the committee site. It can also be found on the Legislative Report site. This was um, submitted to the committee as required under um, pursuant to, oh, uh, to 166, which was one of the miscellaneous ed bills of last year um, in December of last year. Um, so uh, I also did ask and, and follow up because we had um, heard Senator Chittenden's testimony to this committee saying that he was interested in implementing the recommendations that the agency made in the report I just mentioned. Um, but we were confused because in our reading, and by we I mean the agency was confused because in our reading of the bill, the language that's currently introduced does not appear to um, implement the recommendations that we had made um, during the uh, um, during the uh, in our report, I, and again, I think I can clarify that for the senator. Just looking, he came to me and said, "Hey, should I get this bill perfect and get it all right. lined up? Should I wait for you know all these reports, or should I just get it in?" And I said, so, "We'll we'll just get it in. We'll have a conversation. We'll figure uh, it. Looking for some more, some better guidelines." So he, um, so he did um, just uh, he did say the same to me. So we're assuming that. We're bringing forward what our recommendation is to implement the report in terms of language. I'm not going to go over the testimony entirely and read it. Some of it is is a duplicative of the report, but I just wanted to go over very briefly what the what the request of the agency was in the report, which is to convene a group of stakeholders. So we pulled together members of the um, representatives um, uh, for the Vermont NEA, the principals association, the school boards association, and the um, superintendents association. Um, met with them in November of last year talked a little bit about this. We also, as a result of that conversation, realized we needed to do a, a policy scan. Um, and, and I think we would have ideally spent a little bit more time or do, doing that or requested um, that school districts provide us that information. Um, with the burdens on school districts at this time and under the burden of time, we decided not to do that. So instead, what we did was searched um, school district and supervisory union websites for publicly available policies on um, kindergarten entrance age. We found 22 of them. We also have pretty much unanimous um, endorsement or, or endorsement from the wrong word, unanimous feedback that the common practice in the field with very few exceptions is that there is a set kindergarten entrance age of September 1. Um, there are a there are a, a gamut, and it sounds like perhaps Senator Chittenden ran into this with his district, of, of policies um, among some uh, school districts, not all, 
that allow for a waiver process. Um, and those waiver processes, processes vary. The majority of the policies that we were able to find um, are just set up blanket date of September 1. And one thing I want to just clarify for the committee, because it was a little difficult for me early on, um, is uh, that when we talk about students born later in the year, they are by definition younger. So a student born in, um, in November joining in kindergarten is going to be younger than students. And they will be, if, they, if they're born in November, they'll be joining um, kindergarten at age four at the same time as they might be joining with students who are five and potentially age six. Right? So we're just talking about the, the, the later the date is in the year, the, um, the broader range of students all in the same class, if that makes sense. Yeah, we could. Uh, just curious, uh, your comment, I, I just didn't hear it properly. Um, waiver, you support the waiver concept or you don't support the waiver concept? I, mean, um, I didn't hear. Uh, so, so we do uh, we do have a limited recommendation for a waiver that I'll I'll get into in a minute if you don't mind. Um, I just want to pass the mic to my um, colleague uh, Director Case to talk a little bit about um, sort of the developmental implications, which was one of the pieces of feedback that we heard um, from our group of stakeholders. So correct me if I'm wrong, unless I read the wrong report. This one says to do nothing. Correct. So I don't think Senator Chittenden would fully endorse that. That's my gut. He completely disagrees with okay. us on that. Right. And, and we, are, we are operating under the assumption I that the committee will also this. disagree and, and wish to include this, which are so, so we actually provide three recommendations. Okay. Maybe we'll just jump back there really quickly and then we can answer some questions and about. And you're referencing your testimony or the report, right? So in my, in my testimony, I have copied on page two, okay. we've copied um, the re recommendations from the report. If you look at the report, they um, are on page five through, excuse me, six and seven of the report. Um, so our first recommendation is that the General Assembly should take no action. And the reason why is that among all of the needs that we were looking at in the fall of last year, this seems like one that does that is not that is not low hanging fruit um, in terms of, of, of needs for legislative action. The, the we could not find a single example. Excuse me, we could find one example of a school district that did not use a September one cutoff date. That school district used an August thirty first cutoff date. So it does not appear to be. A problem. It sounds like possibly there is some problems with the waiver process in some school districts, and that was certainly a concern that was mentioned. And I do not want to speak for some of the eight, the organizations representing our stakeholder groups. But one of the pieces of feedback that we did here is concern over the the, the question of having a waiver process at all. Um, so, and I'll get into why we recommend a waiver process in a minute. So, in my accurate, but, Mr. Fisher, and I'm sorry to interrupt that. Uh, there was a, a date that Senator Chittenden and his family could go by, but yes. they felt as though their daughter was really ready to get started as parents. And, mm -hmm. you know, and the waiver process that they were looking for didn't work out for them. It, that's very that's very possible. Not okay. knowing his district or what his district's policy would be. Okay, so maybe it's the more consistency, like you're saying. Correct. Like, Senator uh, Hashim. I mean, would it make more sense to focus on the waiver aspect of this instead of changing the changing the cutoff date? Uh, I think that, that seems like so, yeah, yeah. So then let's I jump agree. to our second Senator recommendation. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no. I, 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 I mentioned earlier to uh, Chair Campion, the other piece that is, again, this, this may be off in the future, but four-year-olds oh. technically will now potentially be part of public school system if S-56 passes. So that adds a whole other level of mm -hmm. complexity to what we're doing right now. Just wanted to throw that out there. That's a great point. Thank you for reminding me about that. And that may cause us to postpone or just sort of wait until we see mm. that part of the bill will come to us, the pre-K piece. Um, yeah. So we, Senator Weed. So, so wouldn't it be appropriate to assume, though, that while we're in this conversation, that uh, the assumption would be that the whole date block would move back a year? I mean, it's kind of the same conversation, but it's just Could one year, possibly. twelve months. So like three years instead of four years, kind of thing. Yeah, right. Right. 
I mean, that's kind of, that's in my Maybe, limited. Uh, but there's going to be a lot to that bill, like funding structures will be different. And so, right, and also I think part of that is the whole independent part of that, right? Because there's the pre-K, but if you have your child in a early childhood education program right next to your office, and they also offer that one other year, do you want to keep them in the element, you know, just say, hey, you know, you've got to go to the elementary school now, or do you want to keep them that one extra year in the pre-K program kind of next to your office? I'll just, I'll just note for the, for the reasons you just yeah. dug into, we avoided talking about pre-K for the purposes of this report and really yeah. stuck to the question of kindergarten readiness when it comes to where the cutoff date should be. Um, and one of the things that we did here, so our third recommendation, so, so first recommendation is take no action. Um, the second uh, option is if you don't agree with recommendation one is to standardize the cutoff date of September 1, which is already in common practice. It would have little to no impact either on um, the education fund when it comes to changing the average daily membership, which is an important consideration if you want to change the date significantly and shift how many students are in the cohort. It's a change for one year, but if you decided to change it to January 1, you'd have a bunch of students who would ordinarily be in one class in another class, and that would affect your ADM calculations. Um, we did not look at how it would do that, um, to, but just it's a warning um, there. The last item is the is the third the third recommendation is do not take action action that effectively lowers the kindergarten entrance age. If you're interested in about sort of those reasons why, I'll pass the mic to my colleague Chris. Um, but generally speaking, there was unanimous um, thought among our um, stakeholder colleagues that they did not want. Um, to see a broad inclusion of four-year-olds into um, kindergarten classrooms. Now, I should note, just I don't want to bring pre-K back up again, but um, the pre-K bill currently under consideration in this body, I can't speak for, I understand that there may be a separate version introduced in the House, um, that they also set a date of September 1 in statute. I'm forgetting what section it is, um, but we referenced it before we draft it. So if you jump to the bottom of page three, we have proposed language here. Um, and um, that language assumes uh, that the, the second part of our recommendation um, for the cutoff date of September 1, which is we can see the utility of a 30-day period to allow school districts the flexibility to set a waiver process for any number of potential reasons. Um, some of it's that it is an, it is an artificial cutoff date. So the, the human example I've just been sort of using in conversation is if you have two children who, um, who grew up uh, together, play together, have been in class together, are good friends, and they want to go to kindergarten together, one is born on September 1st, or one is born on September 2nd, or within a week or something, very close in age. I mean, you could even have the extreme example of twins born, you know, on either side of midnight or something like that. There's a there's some reasonable opportunity to give school districts the ability to set some flexibility there, um, and we reference in our draft language that we're proposing to you the ability for school districts to establish procedures or screening methods that it might deem necessary to um, determine kindergarten readiness. And that's because when we did the scan of the policies, we, we did note that many school districts will use kindergarten readiness. We would not suggest that you mandate the use of the last Why thing. Not? The last thing that we want is for them to purchase something, have to purchase something okay. as a result of this that they don't currently use. Okay. So if they have any, whatever their existing processes for determining kindergarten readiness would be something that they could use. And you could probably ask, um, you could probably write language to that effect, um, but we would not recommend that you require them to establish a process they don't already do, and that's purely for reasons of capacity. May I just ask Mr. Case a couple Absolutely. Things. Mr. Case, could you tell us a little bit about kindergarten in Vermont right now? Half day, full day, mandatory? Just give us a little bit of what's, uh, what, what's required and what isn't, and then what's out there. Well, so, um, mandatory, yes. Um, and I don't know, actually, I'm sorry, I'm not prepared to give an answer on some of this. The, the degree to which half day versus full day is represented in this day, like what the how the numbers break down, but happy to do some research on that and get back to you. Well, unless you know, unless you have the information handy, but otherwise, I have to. Well, my question then is: so, so full day is not mandated. Is that right. accurate? So some you you might have a half day, you might have a full day. There are some that do not provide full day. Okay. We're aware of them. I don't know if we have 
good numbers, but we can pull we can pull what we do have. And just send it to Hayden, and I can share it with him. So this would, uh, and again, entrance age is five. Yes. So I, I actually meant to bring current law, and I did not. Um, so current law is that says that students um, who uh, that 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 students must enter kindergarten or, 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 or it's actually in the definition of a legal pupil, right? So, so students may enter kindergarten up until the, uh, you know, up until January 1 of the year, of the school year, of the, the year they turn five. So that it provides for this window in, sta in statute currently because the second, um, the second sentence of that um, says that they, um, May establish essentially a uh, um, school district may establish a policy uh, may pick a date within that August thirty one to um, to January first window. It just so happens that every school, almost every school district in Vermont, at least the ones that we're aware of, um, can, uh, have picked September one. But they could, for example, pick October one. Now, nationally, we did a national scan in our report as well. Nationally, almost every state sets a date. Most set it between July 1 and October 1 of the year that a student turns five. So generally speaking, there's a, there's a nationwide trend that five-year-olds are in kindergarten. Now, it might be you have some students who turn four if a state sets a little bit later date, but generally speaking, most states set it between sometime early in the summer. What if you had a kid and you said, hey, we're not going to put Brian in until he's six. I believe that's allowed currently under statute. What if Brian's seven? I'm just curious, you know, how if that's. I'd want to. I'd want to consult and and come and come back to you, but I'm I'm fairly certain that it is an it is a earliest. There's that's not what a, I'm there's looking not for. A, and then on the other end, Chinden tells me his kids are brilliant. I don't know. Mm -hmm. If they are, could they enter at three? Could they enter at four? Currently, no. Okay. So you, if your school district has a policy under under this under current law, if your school district has a policy that allows for students born before before January one, to 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 go through a waiver process, and not all do. Okay. Um. Then then whatever the waiver process set by the district currently is what your process is. So it sounds like I'm not I'm not familiar with Senator Shin's, um situation, but it sounds like. There may have been a, 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 some school district policies do have a kindergarten screening tool that they use, so they have a way to sort of assess kindergarten readiness. Um, others, others don't. Others say, you know, if the family requests it, up to a certain date will allow it, um, or the, it'll be at the discretion of the principal. Some of these policies are, are fairly vague, and the majority of the of the policies we consulted have no waiver process at all. They simply say. It's a di it's yeah. the data. And the other thing that I'd love to just get rid of is if there's, and you know this district the best, but if there are six seats there and the principal isn't acting, you know, just for whatever reason, the person doesn't want to add additional people or just want to take some of the personality out of it, you know, just take some of the, you know, so as much as we can in terms of guidelines. Does yeah. that make sense? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I, I, I'd be interested. I mean, we we can see the limited, a, a very the the utility of a very limited waiver process. You, of course, could could as you do often give guidelines for what the waiver what the yeah. waiver process might might allow for. Mm -hmm. We currently, I mean, we fall back on our rec recommendation that there's there isn't anything broken here from a policy perspective. Um, understanding that their individual districts may decide something and families may come down on one side or another, but most there, there, you know, in terms of the legislative charge we were given in preparing the report, there, the, in, the, there's a de facto standardization of the kindergarten entrance age. Yeah. Uh, in the stakeholder list, hmm. parents are missing. Correct. I'm curious via PTAs or whatever they're called now. But parent, you know, the parent organizations. Is there? Do you believe that we're missing some of the narrative on why they might want a change of date or more I, more flexibility in waiver? I don't want to. I don't want to speak for my boss. We have yet yet to announce 
the um, we've yet to announce and, and do the final selection of the Family Engagement Council, which is the group that we solicited um, applications for in the in the in the winter in, in December. Um, but yes, the agency believes that there could be more done to foster parent voice at the statewide level. So that's a future initiative, or present to future. S certainly, we. What we did was what was required of us in in the way the language was enabled. I think what you have brought up, Senator Weeks, is a good example of how perhaps the Family Engagement Council could be utilized in the future. If you, and I'm not saying give us more legislative reports to do, <laughs> um, but if you wanted us to do a report back, we could, we could, um, in, we, that group could be consulted, for example, as part of that work. Um, and that's certainly one of the goals of the group is to, is to try to bring the parents' perspective to the floor. Thank you. Is this something which we need to touch on for a few minutes? If there's, you know, besides Senator Chittenden, is there a group or a, you know? It's a great question. I, I suspect there might be a bunch of people out there, and I think points well taken, you know, if you had PTA members or, you know, it's, it, how, do you, how do you gauge, you know, gauge what is actually happening out there? So. It's a great question. I don't know if you've heard stories or others or if this is. I mean, I shared with you all before that my situation was exactly the opposite of Senator Chittenden's. I'm sorry, Senator Chittenden, if you're watching, but. He is. He, his daughter was born, I think, September 2nd? I think so. And mine was September 16th. He petitioned to get in in his district and was denied. I petitioned and I was. Ex it was fine. Mm. So my daughter was able to go to kindergarten. Um, so it, it, it's, it, I, I understand his frustration with the whims of each district. Yeah. I mean, that's, that is frustrating. Um, but I personally, where I live, I haven't heard that it's a big problem. So um, anyway. Yeah, no, I, so it is, it's like you just described, it's the whim of each district. Yeah. But in his case, and I'm sure in other parents' cases, it could cost $14,000 if you can't get in. I want to, um, if you don't mind, Mr. Chair, I, want, I, I need to correct something a moment ago that we that came up. Uh, so I misspoke when you asked about the upper bound age. Okay. And I, I want to double, I'll double check, and if I'm wrong in what I just said here, I will send you an email and, and follow up with the committee to confirm. Um, truancy becomes an issue at age six. So okay. if you do not have a student enrolled in kindergarten at age five, it is not the student is not considered true. If, it can, if the student is enrolled in eight, at age six, so I mean I I I, I think what this is hypothetical. My daughter is is two, so this is still hypothetical for me. But I am thinking about this as we were preparing for testimonies, we were preparing the report, and she her birthday is in November, right? So she will predominantly be age six during the during her period of kindergarten. Assuming that you do not drastically change current law, <laughs> so will she? So she'll start though when she's five in kindergarten. Yes. Yeah. But she will be she right. She'll turn six in in the middle of November. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, I I have to say again, sorry, Senator Durkin, but I, there is a lot of data out there that suggests it's better to be on the older side rather than, there's not a lot of data that suggests it's good to be on the younger side, just generally speaking, broad brush strokes. There are obviously exceptions to the rule, but um, yeah, I know in the BSBA had a had a, an opinion on this as well, because we talked about it over the summer, but um, again, I just think it's all in motion right now because of what we might be doing with pre-K and childcare too. Um, because that would just change the whole landscape. He wouldn't necessarily have to pay $14,000 to go to a private pre-K. Yeah, I mean, if you uh, if you have some of that research, it would be great for you, just to, just so that we have some, so we, we, when we're on the floor, if we get any kinds of questions, it would just, you know, yeah. anything you have would be great along sure. those lines would be sure. big help. I mean, I started late. Um, and hey, look at me. Hey, look at you. I mean, I'm a mess. No. <laughs> Strike that. Uh, but I think mm -hmm. I've heard that like girls can start a little younger. Yeah, so I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'll try to find some of that. Yeah. I, will yeah. Some of that. I know, Director Case, not to put you on the spot, do you have anything you want to add here? 
I think that just what we were thinking about, um, this was largely around developmental readiness. I mean, Ted touched on this in the beginning of, of his presentation, but the idea that, I mean, we, we encourage and want all of our teachers to meet kids where they are, but we also think that there's a big difference developmentally between a child that's four years and eight months and, and you know, one who's five and a half and, and starting kindergarten. So I think that um, we can understand the interest in wanting to standardize an entrance age or a, a, a rather like a, a, a some kind of a waiver process and, and um, a cutoff statewide, but um, are also trying to think about what makes sense in terms of like a child's development. And and um, and I think that is echoing some of the comments that are coming up here. So, um, yeah. Okay. Anything else at this point? I think a lot of good points. Mr. Fisher, would you be our liaison to Senator Chinden? This is his priority. And talk to him a little bit about some of the things that you've shared with us, and um, just so that we don't lose sight of it. Absolutely. Um, and we'll come back. I mean, I'm about to sort of just go through some of the things that I've already put in this one. This education bill as a draft, I mean, this could be something that we put in there um, if the committee is so inclined. You know, just to formalize it or to look at the waiver piece. Could we put in there something that gives districts more guidelines around how to make these decisions? Um, but then that could get into the having to buy the assessment tools, things like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, yeah. I don't know. Okay. Anything else for Mr. Fisher or uh, Mr. Case? Did you want to say something on this bill? And would you introduce yourself? Hi, Sandra Cameron. I'm the Associate Executive Director with Vermont School Boards Association. Uh -huh. So I, I'll be here testifying on Friday. Okay, great. I'm also a licensed early childhood special educator. So great. I'll talk to you about assessments, how sure, we okay. look at development, um, what assessments we already use that wouldn't require additional purchasing. Great. Also the position of our legislative committee that discussed this topic. Great. And if you have anything around what Senator Kulik was mentioning, just some research would be it's it's good for the committee to have uh, you know around you know what are people what is some of the most recent science around waiting around that wave all that kind of thing if you have a document that would be helpful. There is a lot of research. I'm sure that. there's a lot. Yeah. Um, I would say it's COVID era. Okay. So all of it will be affected by what our mm -hmm. our kids in pre-K right now went through an entire their whole life has been in isolation. Yeah. So we don't know yet yeah. what we're going to be facing. I'll talk about all of that. Okay, great. Thank you. We'll see you on Friday then. Thank you again. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to see you. Marilyn in the waiting room? Coming in now. So committee, just so you know, as I'm starting to build a miscellaneous education bill, some of the things that I have taken from these conversations, and first let me tell you the process. Once the miscellaneous education bill is built, that's when we would start to take more testimony on it, really trying to understand some of this. But here are some of the themes in it. Um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, I've got uh, CTE opening up and op opportunities for grades nine through 12. Uh, that would be expanding the language in 16 VSA 1541. Staffing and compensation for the State Board of Education. Uh, study on discrepancy of course offerings, K through 12. Uh, Pre-K choice, this was the Northeast Kingdom choice uh, school district, uh, the woman who came to talk to us about the issue of going over the border. Um, I put in there technology grants for teachers and schools just as a, kind of a placeholder as we're looking to see what all schools have. If there are schools that are not offering certain things, can we make sure that they have the technology you know, so kids can take some of these courses online, et cetera, or, or even maybe hire an additional teacher or pay for an additional teacher if that person isn't in the classroom. So just basically a bunch of studies and things like that. But these are early days. So if there's anything else people are interested in, just let me know. Can I make uh, an addition to the miscellaneous yeah. bill? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think I had mentioned it briefly, um, but I had spoken to some librarians down in Brattleboro and they'd like to start right. the conversation about having libraries be included as a school zone for the purpose of deterring 
um, firearms and drugs being on the property. Um, you know, for example, the Brattleboro Library, you know, the entire top floor is, almost the entire top floor is a kid's section. And, you know, if you have somebody walking around with a firearm, it's, you know, around children, it's, it's you know, reasonably so a very uh, tense situation with the kids and, and library staff. Uh, so yeah, just wanted to advocate yeah. for that. Happy to so listen. Uh, happy to have some language drafted. Can you also just check with uh, Sears if you and Sears can have a yeah. conversation? Also, make sure you're okay with with us working on this. Yes, Senator Julie. How about the notion that our small rural, some of our small rural schools can't take advantage of the farm to school program? Farm to plate. Farm to school. Yeah. Great. I think, are they coming tomorrow? It's farm to school? Yeah. Okay, oh, good. So they're spending yeah. the, about okay. an hour in here tomorrow so we can plan we can a little bit of that. that. Yeah. Uh, didn't I see something uh, about those schools wanting to have uh, a course on how to balance a checkbook? I, don't, I can't remember the word. Financial literacy. Financial literacy. Yeah. 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 That came up over the weekend with yeah. some folks who were like, oh, please put, yeah. put that okay. in. Okay. I'll see if we can develop some language. And this would be, this would leave this committee mid-March. Uh, so it's just want to give Beth some more ideas and get some language. And I don't want to do my, I mean, we put 10 bills once on this land's education bill. For, you know, I'd rather keep it small and tight but mm -hmm. uh, it is it is what it is. We can always reshuffle and kind of reprioritize and make them different drafts. So, and just about you're going to do the school construction. You're going to give us some language. I am. Like, okay, if it's worth it for you, if it makes sense, you don't even if you want to put it in right now, great. But if you just want Beth to take us through it next week, yeah, just forward it to Hayden okay. and say, hey. Just so the committee can get a taste and kind of jump in. Okay. I, I, it depends on how you want to handle I it. I sent it back to Rebecca Wasserman for some tweaking. Oh, so I'm kind of yeah, yeah. waiting for it. I can paint her and see what's okay. happening. But yeah. I, thought I, was, I yeah. was sleeping when you said we were telling yeah. had on that sheet. Yeah, no how about uh, yeah. civics? <laughs> yeah, Is you it know, it's, we're going to continue that. We, we did have a report on what's happening, I think a report is due back on what's happening in our schools around civic education. Yes. Once we get that, I think we should just start to take a look at more seriously. So how it's, people don't, I can tell you this part, not that it, the legislature can do whatever it wants, but people don't like the idea of us requiring it the way we've been talking about requiring it. A lot of people say that it's being met in different classes, social studies, world history, American history. But one of the things that's interesting to me, like this, if we were to build a technology fund where, again, a teacher, this one school needs to have a calculus teacher because kids need that fourth year math to, for whatever, you know, get into. Well, let's make sure that school can access the technology, you know, the, the teacher and have the resources to do it seems to me a part-time, one-off teacher is pretty reasonable. Uh, but maybe there are ways for us to also facilitate good civic education conversations and teaching examples and curriculum, things like that. Yeah, to the, uh, to the civics education point, you know, I think, you know, yeah, there are some things that are covered in social studies class, yeah. but it's, it, it's different when you're going to the state house or going to town meeting and watching these things unfold. Um, you know, and, yeah. and, I, and I think that's one of the best ways to answer the questions of, you know, what is town meeting? Why does it happen? You know, what is the state house and what actually happens mm -hmm. here? And, and I think, you know, having it as part of the curriculum to have kids go into these different places to watch and you know, participate as they can in this, in the process is effective. Um, as is learning about it, you know, in social studies down. It'll stimulate yeah. the desire yeah. for them to, to know about it. Yep. You know, yeah. exactly. I can't agree more. Generally, the state, and this is one of my struggles, is we don't do curriculum. Mm, right. That's local. Yeah. We do standards. 
But what we don't do, and I think some of the schools, districts, some of the states that do better than we do, we don't do requirements. You know, where some states like Massachusetts and New York require certain things, ours are more, the way I think about it is, New York might say, you have to have three years of math to graduate. What we say, and I'm looking to Mr. Fisher, is you have to be able to do X, Y, and Z, however you might get there, that's up to your district, and then the district will do the curriculum. Mr. Fisher. Director Ted Fisher, Vermont Agency of Education and the Agency Structure of Communications and Legislative Affairs. Um, There's got to be an acronym for that. Uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, a part of I think I probably violate the open meeting no, right, part please. if I do that. Or I could press a little button that it could play. <laughs> anyway, um, uh, so yeah, the, the way the standard is currently set is in, in current law, and I'm not going to remember uh, which citation we can follow up, requires um, the, a comprehensive education curriculum that or education program that is in, that is then the, well, what is the EQS, the Education Quality Standards, yeah. which is state board regulation. Um, then underneath that, the state board selects for each subject area a, um, a set of curriculum standards, and those are standards of proficiency. So they are not linked to credit hours or the teaching of a course or teaching of a class in 11th grade or, or right. unlike other states. Um, and those, then they, they, in recent years, since as long as I've been doing this and, and beyond, the state board has adopted national standards for proficiency. In past times, it's my understanding that this, the state board on occasion um, developed in-house Vermont specific standards, and that was, I think, was pre the proficiency model. So those standards are the individual content area standards. So we have um, uh, a global citizenship and foreign language standards, which is where civics falls, for example. We have a common core standards for English language arts and, and a range of different, different standards for all the different areas. And all of the areas that are listed are listed in, in statute and listed in the leave list of the statute. They are listed in education quality standards. So the education quality standards says adopt a standard for each of these areas. And so that's sort of where the, the, the sort of regulatory funnel goes down. Um, there are some statutory requirements um, for specific areas. There's a comprehensive health um, uh, requirement. We are asking um, the legislature to consider a um, anti-hate curriculum requirement for this year. So there, there are extra, there are requirements for sp teaching specific things that exist in some parts of statute, separate from the education quality standards. But the proficiency-based system is set forth in the education quality standards and then adopted, you know, standard by standard by standard. We can pull some of this apart. I'm so happy to provide you all the, all the links. I have a sort of set email that I send because we have lots of questions from national reporters and things who want to know, does Vermont teach civics? And the answer is yes. We just don't have a requirement. The same way others. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Cargill. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? I am great. How are all of you? Great. Speaking for everyone. Uh, we had a, com a conversation with you last week trying to get our heads around if we are doing a Come Teach in Vermont campaign, what does it look like for a teacher who would arrive here either from out of state or graduate in state and enter the teaching career? Uh, and what does that look like specifically as it relates to some student loan debt, relief, some, uh, you know, uh, yeah, I would say just the student loan debt relief is a great way, great place to start. Okay, so with, when it comes to student loan debt relief, the yeah. federal government has two different programs that help students with any federal debt that they have taken out in the teaching field. So the first one is Federal Teacher Loan Forgiveness Program. This program, once a qualified teacher and that qualification has to be certified by an administrator at that school, so the superintendent or the principal, has been teaching for five years 
they mm -hmm. can have up to five thousand dollars in their federal student loans forgiven if they are teaching in a specific high need area such as special ed math or science they can receive an additional 12,500 for a total of 17,500 forgiven. After five years. After five years. In addition to that program, teachers for the most part are going to qualify for another program the federal government offers called public service loan forgiveness. This program is broader than just teachers. It's for anyone that's working in a public service position. And at the end of 10 years, any loan that is remaining is forgiven. So students need to make 120 payments, so 12 payments a month for those 10 years. And they have to be enrolled in what is called an income-driven repayment plan. So if you think about a standard loan, when you take a loan out, they divide the amount that you need to repay over a 10 year period. We'll just go with a really simple example. And that's your standard repayment. An income driven repayment plan actually looks at your income and makes an estimate of a payment based on income and debt. So those programs always are less if you're in one and you qualify, they're less than the standard payment. So in a course of 10 years under an income driven repayment plan, you would not repay the entire amount. And so whatever was remaining uh, would be forgiven with public service loan forgiveness. These two programs are stackable. So you can receive the teacher loan forgiveness at five years and then under normal circumstances, you would start a 10-year process to determine if you were eligible for public service loan forgiveness. So those are the two federal programs that exist for teachers. So we're, we heard from the McClure Foundation earlier today, and they told us in 10 years, we were, are likely to be short 4,400 nurses roughly, and in 10 years, we're going to be short roughly 8,000 teachers, carpenters roughly 5,000, and bookkeeping and accounting 5,000. So teachers are really going to, we're going to continue with this, this struggle. I'm wondering, are we, treat, treating isn't the right word, but are, are we, if, you're, if you want to be a nurse in Vermont, compared to a teacher in Vermont, looking at just these numbers, is the state kicking in state funds right now for nursing? It doesn't sound like we are for teaching, but it sounds like VSAC is going a little bit, giving something to nurses. That's correct. So the legislature has a program that is a loan forgiveness program. So it functions like a scholarship, and if mm -hmm. this nurse works in Vermont for one year, for each year that they receive this scholarship, which pays for full tuition up to the cost of the tuition at the University of Vermont, uh, if for each year they work, that year of funding is forgiven. They pay it back with a work obligation. We have that for nurses. We have it for trades. I think you mentioned construction workers. We have yeah. a brand new program that does the exact same thing for trades. The National Guard has one. Dentist, primary care physicians has a program, um, as well as we're just standing up mental health professionals and nurse faculty. So you're right. There are a number of careers in Vermont that have these programs that actually reduce the amount that students need to borrow at the front end of their education versus repaying loans after they've completed their education that do not exist for teachers. Do we have any that act the way the federal government acts uh, for uh, teachers and public policy people for nurses also? I'm not sure if I'm asking. So 
There are programs that Vermont runs. They're not run by VSAC, but there are programs that have loan repayment that are targeted for nurses. They're run by AHEC. Um, wow. And there is a new program that you started last year that is providing loan forgiveness to encourage recent graduates to stay and work in Vermont. It's not targeted to any particular sector. Uh, but those are the programs that I'm familiar with. There's also programs, I think, for some of the other health programs that AHEC runs, but they're they're definitely health related. They're not for teachers. Uh, Marilyn, I had um, uh, some questions here. So how does a student find out about this loan forgiveness program? And, you know, I, because I'm just, thinking of somebody who's you know looking at different programs online trying to figure out how to finance their education um, you know how how do they end up learning about this or getting enrolled yeah i think that's a really fair and good question so the the federal loans are serviced by um servicers across the country vsac does not do this work uh, those servicers are notifying customers and answering questions that are directly asked of them. DSAC will work with anyone who calls us. We can certainly counsel on federal loans, even though we don't actually service that loan, but we can counsel on them. We'll let them know what services are or what options are available to help them with repayment. But it really does depend on the borrower reaching out more than it does on information being sent to the borrower. So what, what about the Vermont Loan Forgiveness Program? Is that? So the Vermont Loan Forgiveness Programs, the programs that we have where we're offering these that work like scholarships, we notify the institutions that run the program. So the nursing programs in Vermont that are at Castleton, UVM, Norwich, they're all aware of the nursing loan forgiveness program, for example. So we go through the schools to help notify students. We also use uh, a very generic like front porch forum, radio ads, public service announcements, um, re, uh, uh, sorry, newspapers. We'll use those types of vehicles to get information out about these programs. We have a website that is a workforce development website that has information about these programs. Uh, you'll see schools talking about them as well. But those are the outreach. And we'll certainly be working on, in the high schools, letting the CTE programs and the high school programs know about the uh, forgivable loan options that their students might be interested in. Thank you. Senator Williams. Do we do any of this outside of the state of Vermont? to try and attract teachers in the state? Do. So not for teachers, but for example, the nursing program is not residency based. Okay. If you are an out of state student interested and willing to work in Vermont upon completion of your licensure, you can apply for the nursing scholarship. That same is true with the trade scholarship. The National Guard program is available to any member of the Vermont National Guard, even if they happen to live in Massachusetts or New York. Marilyn, would you be willing to talk with our Ledge Council? I'm just going to ask her to draft a paragraph, basically that kind of pulls the teachers in with everybody else that you mentioned, just so the committee can consider it. Happy to do that. Okay, I'll have her reach out to you. That would be great. Great. Any other questions or comments for Ms. Harvey? Thank you very much. It was very helpful. Appreciate the follow-up. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Okay, committee, that uh, concludes our work for the day. I'll look forward to seeing everybody tomorrow. I'm sorry, Mr. Fisher, do you want to say something? I really do apologize no, for okay. the uh, chair's uh, blessing. I uh, just wanted to add one for the record, Ted Fisher. I'm going to just <laughs> yeah. leave it there. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, I just wanted to slightly clarify what you said earlier in terms of the question. So students must be enrolled in school by the time they turn six. <coughs> For most students, this occurs when they're in kindergarten. Kindergarten is not mandatory, but enrollment by, is, by six is, for many families, it's, it, it aligns with the requirement. So most students who are joining, if they're enrolling at age six, they're entering into kindergarten. Okay. It's the way that the years fall. Yeah. So I wanted to just clarify No, that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Anything else? You're okay? No, I'm great. Okay, good. Okay. We'll see you, we'll see you later this week. Okay. Um, Thanks, everyone. We're adjourned.